All right, Bridget, are you good to go? Yes, I am. Thank you. Brian, if you are ready, I am ready. All right. So it's 6.32, so I'm going to call this a September meeting of the Jersey City Historic Preservation Commission to order. Please be advised that in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, the notice of the time, date, and place, and agenda of this regularly scheduled Historic Preservation Commission was sent to the Jersey Journal, the Jersey City Reporter, and Ellis Besalito on Friday, September 9th. Same notice was sent to the city clerk for posting on the bulletin board outside of the clerk's office in City Hall and on the city website. I have proof of this notice here in evidence. Bridget, we can go ahead and mark this as B1. Okay, this will be B1 in evidence for tonight's meeting. Great, thank you. All right, we'll move to attendance. Um, Commissioner Sakha? Present. Okay, Commissioner Gugiardo is absent. Commissioner Lewis? Present. Commissioner Gordon? Present. Commissioner Amatuza? Present. Commissioner Stango is absent. Commissioner Gunther? Here. Vice Chair Samkam? Here. And Chairman Blazak? Here. Okay, there are seven members of the commission in attendance. Five affirmative votes, oh, excuse me, <laughs> are needed for a certificate of appropriateness. Moving down the agenda, the next item we have is approval of minutes. These were for the July HPC meeting. Um, I believe the only person currently here that was not present at that meeting was Kelly. Does anyone have any questions, concerns about those minutes? Okay. Staff recommends a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, I have Robert for that. All right, Kelly, because you were not here, I'll do a roll call for this. Um, Commissioner Amatuzo? Aye. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Lewis? Court Okay. Commissioner Sakong? Aye. Commissioner Gordon? Aye. Commissioner Gunther? Aye. Commissioner Gucciardo is absent. Commissioner Stango is absent. Vice Chair Sankan? Aye. And Chairman Blazak? Aye. Okay, there are six votes in favor, no nays, one abstention. Those minutes are approved. Um, copies of correspondence and uh, are all and all application materials linked on the agenda under the application number. Um, at this time, time staff has no announcements. If there are any members of the public who would like to speak regarding matters of historic preservation that are not listed on tonight's agenda, so this would be regarding things that are not listed on tonight's agenda, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of the screen. If you're on the phone, you can press star nine if you would like to address the commission. Okay, staff sees no hands raised and recommends a motion to open and close public comment. Motion. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Great. All right. So we have, so we do have old business listed on tonight's agenda, but um, we were hoping to just switch around a couple of the cases quickly um, in order to accommodate uh, some of the planning staff that's on the call. So Brian, if it's okay with you, staff would like for 9A of new business, uh, which is H22401, to be heard first. Okay, um, do we, and then we'll go, we'll, so we'll hear um, H22401 and then go back to old business and then finally return to uh, H22403 then? Yes, that is the end plan. Okay. Do we need, do we need uh, a motion to do that? I forget. It's been a while. I My understanding is that it's at the discretion of the chairman, but if you want to mm. cover our bases, we can make a motion. Let's, I'll make a motion to change the order and then to how I just indicated. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. So we are going to start with H22402. Um, so this is a internal planning case number. You'll notice that there's no applicant listed because the applicant is the Division of City Planning. Um, so this is for review and recommendation of amendments to the Lewis Munoz Marin Boulevard Redevelopment Plan, formerly known as the Henderson Street Redevelopment Plan. Um, 
more <laughs> informally known as Block One of the Embankment. Um, so um, I, 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 <laughs> we don't have enough time to discuss the storied history of the Embankment, um, but the city is actively looking to uh, redevelop that area based on that law. Actually, before I get even further, Austin, do you wanna? Yeah, so uh, Mr. Chairman, I have to recuse um, from this case because um, I'm becoming involved with the Bangladesh Preservation Coalition. So uh, I will see you on the other side of this. Thank you, Austin. So I guess, Maggie, you'll, you'll demote him down to a uh, attendee for the time being and we promote him when this is, item is finished. Yes. All right. Looks like Austin. Sorry about that. Um, so the city has been actively working on creating a redevelopment plan for the embankment, which is all eight blocks of the embankment. Um, early, originally this summer, we had held a public uh, community meeting discussing the development of the embankment where the city was proposing to create one redevelopment plan for all eight blocks of the embankment, uh, where in that redevelopment plan, block one was developed by a uh, designated developer and then blocks two through six were dedicated back to the city and then seven and eight had their own portion of that redevelopment plan as well. Um, after reviewing all of the options that they had under this redevelopment plan, the developer decided to pursue their existing zoning for block one, which is what they're entitled to under the redevelopment plan we're going to be looking at the amendments for today. They're entitled to this zoning, they can build this zoning today if they wanted to, but because of that, we wanted to, because of that and the fact that they want to pursue this zoning, we wanted to go back in and tighten up that language in the redevelopment plan. Um, to make sure that there were enough H, uh, HPC related elements that we would ensure that the, those portions of block one that are remaining are protected. So the city's current plan is to uh, split these redevelopment plans up. Like I said, we're tightening up the language in the Lewis Marin plan so that we have more preservation language and then we'll be creating a separate redevelopment plan for blocks two through eight of the embankment. Right now, that language is still being finalized. We had a second community meeting uh, last week. Some of the things that Mallory and I are gonna show you tonight will look familiar if you were on that community meeting. Um, but we are finishing up that language and that redevelopment plan right now is tentatively scheduled for our next HPC meeting on October 3rd. So I'm gonna throw up a couple slides. Uh, again, they're very similar to what we presented to the community last week with a couple amendments that focus a little bit more on the HPC. Maggie, could you slow down a little, please? Sorry. Um, we're going to throw up some slides and kind of walk you guys through what these proposed changes are. So Bridget, I'm gonna share my screen. We can. We did not previously submit this, so we can go ahead and call this um, uh, B2. And just describe it for the record, Maggie, please. Um, the Lewis Marin Marin Boulevard redevelopment plan presentation. Okay, that would be B2. Yes. Great. Thank you. And we were doing H2201 right now? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Can you guys see this? Oh. Yes. Let me go full screen Thanks. right now. Let me say. Okay, can you still see this? Yes. Great. Yeah. All right. So this is just a quick overview of the embankment blocks for everyone. So you can see starting from right to left blocks numbered one through eight. Um, blocks one through six, which are the, is the section with the blue band around it. Those are the sections that are locally listed as local landmarks and are under HPC's jurisdiction. Seven and eight are not locally listed landmarks. However, they are identified landmarks and we do have some oversight over them, um, but it's blocks one through six that are required to submit applications for review to the HPC. Block one is the one with the purple overlay. That's the one that we're gonna be discussing today. So that block is situated between Marin Boulevard and Manila Avenue, um, fronting Sixth Street and then that alleyway on Fifth Street. Um, as we go through some of the HP standards, we're going to be talking about the embankment structure. That specifically means uh, what is left of the stone there, um, just the historic fabric left on site. 
So Mallory, if you want to kind of talk us through what is uh, proposed for block one and what the existing zoning is. Sure. Hi, Commissioners. Mallory Clark Sokolov of City Planning. I'm a senior planner, been on board with the city a little over four years at this point. Um, so just to kind of expand on what Maggie has already introduced, um, we're talking specifically about what is identified in the Lewis Marin plan as District 2. So towards the right, you'll see a green block. So District 2 represents block one of the embankment. Um, and currently the developer has chosen to pursue their existing zoning rights. So the, the main parameters of their existing zoning are to remain in place. There will not be changes. What we're really looking at in the scope of the amendments from a planning perspective are some um, urban design changes and clarifications that are proposed uh, to the existing language. So what that means, um, so we are working, as Maggie said, simultaneously drafting a new embankment plan that will cover the scope of box two through eight, which will be brought to you hopefully at the next meeting in early October. And um, tonight we're just here to focus on the scope of the changes regarding block one. Um, and ultimately the whole point of all of this is um, based on some language that does already exist in the plan, which uh, is really look, looking at closing some ongoing litigation, long ongoing litigation regarding the embankment. And uh, essentially the development of block one is contingent upon the transfer of the land of blocks two through eight to the city to be used for open space. So the city will take ownership of blocks two through eight. Um, a portion of block seven will be subdivided out, but you'll get to learn more about that at the next meeting. But really the whole point of making these adjustments to block one is to fa help facilitate that redevelopment and in turn help the city gain ownership of blocks two through eight. Um, in terms of what is changing, like I said, the, the main planning parameters are not being touched as part of these amendments. So the maximum density that is permitted in the existing plan is 400 residential units and 200 hotel rooms on block one. And that will not change. The maximum FAR that's permitted on block one is 11.25, that will not change. The maximum height, the current uh, configuration for the block envisions a base and two towers. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, um, but it envisions two towers, one westerly tower at 35 stories and an easterly tower at 45 stories. The scope of the changes from a planning perspective that are proposed before you tonight are to consolidate those into one 45 story tower. So it'll have a slightly larger footprint than what the two individual towers were permitted to have as individual towers, but it will um, pick up a lot of efficiencies in terms of construction and just uh, general utilization of the site that will be a benefit to both the developer, but also the public as well, a lot less disruption in construction of the project over time. Maggie, you can jump to the next slide. Uh, before we move on, what is an FAR? That's the floor to area ratio. So that controls ultimately the amount of building that the developers permitted to build on site. And what that is, is looking at um, the square footage of the building they're allowed to build in proportion to the size of the lot they're building on. In proportion to the? Size of the lot they are building on. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Great, um, so I just wanted to take you through a quick overview of the, the form uh, that is discussed in the plan. A lot of this is existing language. Again, I'll, I'll clarify what's changing. So not all of this is being introduced, but just so you have a better understanding of what project you can anticipate on the block. Um, the, the form that's contemplated for block one is made up of a parking base, which is uh, a couple of stories of parking, which would be sitting in with, within what we notice today as the existing embankment structure and the base roof deck. So the roof of that parking base uh, will have two main components. Part of that roof deck will be private and part of it will be public. So as part of the uh, goal of creating a continuous open space and trail corridor through, through the whole embankment project, so blocks one through eight, um, there will be 
a public right of way on block one as a requirement of the development. That requirement does exist today. It's being reinforced and just specified a little bit uh, more clearly in the amendments that are before you. Um, and so what this means is, like I said, you have this parking base that takes up kind of the existing uh, height of, of the embankment structure and the northerly portion of the northerly property line, which fronts onto 6th Street, will have a 30 foot wide uh, public walkway on the on the roof deck, essentially the roof deck of the parking structure. After that 30 foot right of way moving south towards the south property line um, is where development will occur. So you have the parking base and then the residential and hotel uses will be able to develop above that, starting with the base roof deck. Um, so the base roof deck is permitted to be privatized, so that can be used for private amenity, but that public right of way needs to be a minimum of 30 feet wide for the continuation of the block. The developer has several other required contributions, which we can talk about if you have any questions, but those are existing in the plan. And um, really what they, what they come down to essentially for your knowledge is um, they're required to build a grand staircase fronting on the Marin Boulevard frontage. So uh, on the bottom right of the graphic here, you can see that staircase that is required to have a bike channel so that bikers can easily go up and down without having to access an elevator. They are required to provide an ADA uh, accessible elevator from the street grade level. So the sidewalk um, along Marin up to the embankment right of way. So there will be elevator access. And they're required to provide an ADA accessible bridge from blocks one to two of the embankment. So they will be providing a bridge over Manila Avenue into the, the second block of the embankment or the first block of the, of the park space in the future. Uh, Maggie, you can move on. And then um, what occurs in terms of the development. So what the proposed changes are to the plan as it stands today are to uh, develop the site as one tower element at a maximum of 45 stories. And what they're really looking for in terms of the changes to the language are changes to the permitted tower dimension. So right now, as I said, the plan contemplates a two tower configuration and each tower is permitted to be 105 feet by 75 feet. They're just proposing to consolidate that into one massing, which would be 210 feet long by 75 feet. So they're not gaining square footage. They're just simply allowed to develop it as one building as opposed to two buildings. And um, just for clarity, this is not, um, I guess this is clarified in, in the language amendments before you. The tower is required a minimum step back of 15 feet from the Southern property line the eastern property line and the western property line. Now they will have more than a 15 foot setback on one of those sides, but it just gives them the flexibility to kind of toggle that massing above the base roof deck. Um, and, and really the plan and the, and the conversation has been to favor that bulk towards the Marin Boulevard side of things where you have other taller tower configurations developed throughout the city. Um, so I think that clarifies things from a planning perspective. Maggie will go over the historic preservation language in detail, but if you have any questions right now for me, I'm happy to answer, or if you want to wait till the end of the presentation for questions, that's fine too. Let's keep moving on this. Okay. All right, so moving on to the historic preservation standards. So, um, when reviewing the changes that were the amendments we're making to this redevelopment plan, um, all of that new language that is highlighted in yellow, right? So on the uh, information that was distributed to you guys, those final versions are all yellow. You'll notice when you review it, it starts around page 10. All of that yellow language is historic preservation standards. We were really focused on bulking up um, the preservation standards within this redevelopment plan to ensure that we retained the historic fabric that we could on block one. That being said, block one of the embankment has the least amount of existing historic fabric remaining. Um, there certainly is a good amount of historic fabric on block one, but especially on that Marin Boulevard side, um, we have lost a significant amount of stones there. The ones that are currently extant are not necessarily in fantastic shape. They need to be repointed, things like that. Um, so that is why uh, block one 
is being developed rather than blocks two through six. So like Mallory said, in order for us to be able to preserve and rehabilitate blocks two through six into park space, um, block the, the exchange here is that block one will be redeveloped while retaining the historic fabric that's existing. So the remaining embankment structure, which again is more focused towards that Manila Avenue side, um, is going to be incorporated into any new development and then visually it will act as a transition to the more intact embankment blocks. So we wrote into this plan that all of the existing, all work on the his existing historic fabric will be guided by the treatment for historic properties, the city's design standards and applicable preservation briefs. Um, we wanted to cover our bases as much as possible and give as many resources as we could to be guided by. Um, in addition to the fact that because block one is designated, all proposed development, all proposed work, everything still has to come to the HPC, still requires an HPC application and either um, HPC or staff review. The developer will also be required to document block one prior to construction to a HABS hair level two documentation. Um, that's a Secretary of the Interior standard for measured drawings. So we will uh, get a full measured drawing for block one. Um, part of this plan written in is that any stones that need to be removed in order to accommodate development on block one um, will need specific documentation within those Habs hair drawings. Um, we also- Do you think that was what, Maggie? So H, it's, it's capital H, they're acronyms. H-A-B-S. I, 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 I didn't know what you were saying. Habs hair. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. well, just so I, I should probably clarify, it, Habs is the Historic American Building Survey and hair is the Historic American Engineering Record. Um, so we do accommodate losing some embankment stones as a result of the development. However, we added in standards that require for those stones to be moved and reused in part of the, as part of the park development um, on blocks two through eight at the city's discretion. Um, and we also provide some guidance on, for block one specifically, on appropriate materials for the development that will directly abut the remaining historic fabric. So directly abutting that, those, tra uh, I'll call them transitional, retain, rem transitional element of the remaining historic embankment structure. So we're encouraging mostly masonry materials there, things you would have seen historically, and we're discouraging inappropriate materials like stucco, EFIS, metal panels, thin bricks, cement board and panels, things like that, that really um, don't provide any context next to the embankment stones. Um, and then we also provided some relatively basic guidance for new elements that we're adding. So um, this per is particular to bridges, stairs, elevators, things like that. Um, all of the, any new bridges between embankment blocks. So this is specifically for the one that the developer will be building between block one and block two. However, this language is planned to be mimicked for blocks two through six as well. Um, we want those bridges to be of a modern design. Um, they can visually refer to previous historic structures that were there, but they shouldn't copy or reconstruct them. Um, that's following Secretary of the Interior guidance we really don't, it, it's really not appropriate to completely reconstruct something here. So we would like to see a modern design in this case. And sim we have similar guidance for elevators and stairs as well. They should also be of a modern design. However, all of those elements um, should be designed and installed in a removable fashion, which follows the Secretary of the Interior Standards as well. So that if they needed to be removed in the future, we're not gonna harm what's left of that historic uh, embankment structure. So those are the, the historic preservation standards that are in this plan. I know that we went through that pretty fast, um, but it does more or less cover everything that's in that plan. However, if we miss something that you guys caught that you'd like to discuss, I think that we're ready and willing to do that. I think the most basic question for me is what is the scope of our review here? So because this is a redevelopment plan, we while HPC does have review and we will get review for anything that is proposed on block one, 
we are guided by the standards in the redevelopment plan. So similarly to what Mallory just showed all of you guys, um, the HBC will get an application for a very tall tower on this block. Um, we'll be reviewing it based on the standards that are in the redevelopment plan, as well as what they're proposing at that base level, looking at the historic embankment structure, making sure that they align with the standards in the plan there as well. So if so, they, the developer comes to us with something like beyond what's in that plan, that obviously would not be permitted, but we don't necessarily have as much flexibility as we would for say, asking someone to reduce height for a very specific example. You're talking about later on down the road, once these amendments have been adopted, but for yes. the review of these amendments that we're conducting right oh, now. I'm sorry. Yes, so um, you guys are reviewing this. We, you can request comments, you can request changes, but um, this needs to be reviewed by planning board as well as go to city council. So um, our role tonight is to review and either recommend this for adoption to the planning board or make or request staff make changes that would then come back to you guys. Is this another situation where we are recommending a recommendation? <laughs> yes, because it has to go to city council. So we are recommending to the planning board, the planning board is recommending to city council. Understood. Um, one question I had is the, plan specifies how many units are permitted um, and there is a parking base. Does that specify how many parking units will be placed there? Yes, so the plan, and this is again, not um, within the scope of the amendments that are before you, but the existing adopted plan has a maximum of 260 parking spaces on the site. Thank you. And under the historic standards, um, we are encouraging and discouraging the use of certain materials. Since it seems like it's just a recommendation, do those actually have any sort of legal effect or are we just putting them on the record that we encourage those? We can, I mean, we can certainly say that is a discouraged material, please change it. Um, we have language in our existing HP ordinance that discourages certain materials like vinyl that we regularly say that's a discouraged material, please change that. So the office standard is that the discouragement of a material means that you should not be using it. I see. So then later when the tower is being proposed to be built and we're reviewing it at that time, we could conceivably deny the application because of their non-compliance with those recommendations. Is that right? If it's specific to that tower base, yeah. Understood. Um, and uh, what happens if the settlement efforts fail? What is the effect of the amendment? Is it void at that point? It's not void if it's adopted by city council, but because the plan is written in a way where um, it's contingent upon the settlement settling, um, the, they wouldn't be able to pursue this zoning. And so what the plan reads then is that there, they would refer back to what's called R4 zoning rights in the city, which is a lower um, a lower density and, and lower height district than what is contemplated if they, you know, if we do uh, resolve the settlement and they do transfer blocks two through eight, but they basically revert to existing zoning, pre-existing ex zoning. Got it. Those are all my questions. Thank you. So is there a reason that we're not hearing this at the same time as the other seven blocks of the embankment? Kind of all as one package? So originally we were on um, kind of a slightly offset timeline. We will be now kind of joining those timelines back up for the purposes of the planning board. But because the new plan is uh, the scope of that is much bigger in the sense that these are just minor changes to the existing plan and just an amendment versus introducing an entirely new plan. We wanted to allot an appropriate amount of time for presentation at both boards. And also we wanted to allot a lot more time um, following the community meeting to incorporate public feedback on the new plan because we envisioned that to be much more substantial comment wise than um, just the tweaking of existing language. And maybe maybe we should take questions first, but I, that is something I was interested to hear about 
um, is what the feedback was after last week's community meeting, but maybe we should leave that to, because uh, I know I have a few additional questions myself um, and maybe some other commissioners do as well, but that is something I was interested in hearing uh, uh, from planning staff. Um, Robert had a question on parking, um, asking the maximum amount of, of parking spaces. Is there a minimum amount of parking spaces? There is not a minimum in the plan. Okay, uh, so is, is it envisioned that the parking structure will be contained within the existing embankment structure? Or the yes, so the way the plan reads is that um, the height of the parking structure is permitted to be, so the height of the public walkway on the, the portion of the roof deck that's, that's public walkway has to be equal to the surface elevation of block two. So basically creating a continuous walkway. So you're not changing, you know, the level of where the walkway exists between block one and two. Um, now, the portion of the development that is uh, private, let's say, and not not within that 30 foot right of way is permitted to go another eight feet. So there could be like an eight foot grade change between the, the public walkway and the cap of the parking base. So it'll essentially be the same level with up to an eight foot difference. And is there has there been any study about, about um, keeping the, the height or the cap of the parking space to be the same height as the walkway? And like, it, would that be a large reduction in number of spaces or? Yeah, that was really the outcome of the conversations between um, the all the parties of the settlement agreement. So again, this is a little bit of a weird animal because there's ongoing litigation around this too. So this isn't just a planning document or just you know, HPC document, this is also subject to some settlement agreements, uh, you know, that we're hoping to wrap up between multiple parties. Um, but essentially what was found in high level feasibility studies is that it would, it would significantly impact how much parking capacity they had if they couldn't have some level of a grade difference. And just that um, minor difference of about eight feet would it enable them to utilize a mechanical parking system that could maximize their numbers within the base. Okay. And was there any consideration, I don't know if you can reveal this, if it's subject to litigation, to reducing or eliminating parking, because that is one of my uh, pet peeves with urban design in Jersey City is the large parking decks, uh, especially in this location, which is within walking distance of multiple path train stops uh, and the light rail. Uh, there hasn't been because we don't have a minimum in the plan. So that, you know, allows for the, the 260 parking spaces, uh, to my knowledge, were the result of a uh, an approach towards a settlement agreement between the parties. So that was something that all parties had agreed to. Um, and then the the plan, the amendments that, or the language as adopted in the plan today incorporated that. So that was a decision that was made many years back. Um, and we just have not touched it in the sense that it's only defined as a maximum. So a project could conceivably come forward with no parking and be fully compliant. Okay, thank you. I think that's all I have for the moment. Uh, open up to other commissioners. I have a question about the height of the tower. I see that there's a limit on the number of stories. Um, is there any language regarding how tall a story can be, how tall the building can be? There's a minimum floor to ceiling heights. Um, one second, let me just, I just wanna pull up the document really quick and make sure I'm answering you correctly. So there are um, minimum floor to ceiling heights for the um, residential floors, basically determined by the use of, of the, building and those are um, to, to be consistent, but there's not a clearly defined limitation on a floor by floor height. So um, there's some flexibility there, but um, you know, preliminary conversations we've had, they're very much in line with standard development floor to floor ratio. So we're not seeing, it's not like the conversations we're having in terms of uh, draft design um, are like, you know, 25 foot stories <laughs> all the way up. It's, it's just not, uh, uh, that's not a financeable project. So everything is very in line with what you'd see with any uh, typical new development throughout the city. But the minimum threshold there for residential floors, um, consistent with much of the rest of the zoning in the city is a nine foot 
uh, ceiling floor to floor with a slightly larger, typically a slightly larger ground floor. Anyone else have any questions? I had a question about the parking base, and that is, um, it didn't seem to discuss anything about the perimeter of that parking base itself, as this particular uh, embankment structure is, in some areas, very low. That that parking base is going to project right out of the stones. Is it is it going to be sitting? Sit, it, can it situate itself just inside the stones? Is that the idea? So. So I will just say part of the um, approach to developing block one is that some stones are going to be removed, especially on that Marin Boulevard side where you have those lower stones. Um, the plan does specifically call for uh, the Manila Boulevard fronted side, so the west side of block one, that wall plus where you turn the corner on either side to be retained. Um, but everything except for that, which those stones are in the best shape, that is the most intact historic fabric on block one. But as you start to move east towards Marin Boulevard, those stones are in less, they're less intact. Um, and those are the ones that based on the wording of these guidelines are, the developer has the ability to be a little bit more flexible with provided that everything is documented before they begin construction. The location of those stones is documented before they begin construction. And those stones are retained and reused on the rest of the, the park development of the rest of the embankment blocks. I don't know so if that answered your question. Well, kind of. So we're gonna see this large parking structure with some residual stones around it that are in some places just a few feet high and a, you know, what, a 20 some foot 25 foot parking structure or 30 foot parking structure. And then we're gonna we're gonna see these this perimeter of residual stones around that parking structure. Is that am I getting this right? Because uh, you know, when you visualize it in plan, you say, oh, there's stones, it'll be this grand staircase with stones around it, but it's not. It's gonna be a probably a, a steel and brick, maybe a you know, exterior parking structure. And is there any provide providing the screening for the parking structure around it. Is there any regulation on that? So there are some, um, there is some language that exists in the plan and then we are strengthening it. Uh, we added just a couple extra sentences in some places um, requiring that, that screening to be um, like a basically a primary material. And so it doesn't feel like back of house kind of operations along the street frontage. It's also required anywhere it's visible from the embankment right away to be fully screened. Uh, so you would not see the parking structure. You would just read it as facade of a building. And there will be other operations, um, particularly like at the Manila Ave, or sorry, the Marin Ave frontage um, on that ground level, you will have the elevator access. It is very likely that the developer will still provide a secondary lobby so that you know people can get up to the residential tower from either the embankment level or the street level. So you will still have some normal facilities you would have in uh, you know any building that's that's not in this configuration where you have kind of two ground floors almost um, in the way that the project will build out, you will still have. And then we do allow for commercial on that ground floor as well. So they could put like a cafe space, a retail space, um, something of that. They have the option to do that at the ground level. Uh, when you think about this particular block, um, I guess I, I'm sitting here thinking about the buildings over on the other embankment that are closer to the, 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 the tunnel access. Uh, the 10th the, street. Yeah, is that the 10th Street? It's 10th Street, that embankment. And there's multiple buildings that have parking entrances uh, that are through the stone embankments. And I visualized that first, but then I thought, you know what, this particular embankment section is very short. And so we're going to see, we're not going to see it like that. We're going to see an actual building base, you know. Yes. And, and some stones around it, really. Yes, you will. Okay. And I think, like Maggie kind of said earlier, you know, it's envisioned that this is going to be the area that's going to be and maybe I'm using a wrong word, but kind of sacrificed 
to allow for development here on this lot so that the rest of the blocks to the west will remain more um, uh, pristine, I suppose, and, and allow for- I, I would use preserved, but yeah. <laughs> it will be preserved uh, further to the west to allow for this. And obviously it's been a series of complex negotiations going back over 20 years now. I think we're all aware of some of the backstory. Um, so I think I would keep that in mind as well. And this is like, I think Maggie said as well, this is the least intact of the blocks until you get uh, west of uh, Monmouth or so. And, you know, on that northeast corner of Six and Marina, there's even some uh, like concrete block and, you know, where there's those um, advertising signs and areas that are just completely altered so those will all be gone and taken out of out of here as well so i have one more question we were talking about the western edge of block one how that will be preserved and turning up the corner are there any is there any have you quantified how much of the corner is going to be retained or needs to be retained or is that codified at all there is like there is specific language within uh hold on i can now do you have the plan up i don't know where mine went yes i can it's, yeah i can show you where because this was actually the last, this was the only thing that changed between the draft that I sent you guys on Wednesday. I just need privileges to share my screen. <sighs> Sorry. You should be good. Okay, I just- All right, so the HPC language is on 10, so it would be past that. Let me know if I'm scrolling too fast. No, you're not. All right, let's, I want to say it's on page 12. Let's keep going down. I know it's in district four. Okay, keep going just a little bit further. It's the next, mm, maybe not. Now it was the section where we, added the word preserve in on Friday. It was below oh. this, I think. I think that's... Oh, did that move? Hold on, expand. I think that was up, actually. Oh my gosh, you're right, you're right. Uh, yeah, up, because it was with the screening. Okay, there we go, it's right there, yeah. So you can see, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, line down. The Marin frontage and a portion of the 6th Street frontage at the northwest corner of the property shall incorporate the embankment stone into the facade in such a way that preserves the original pattern and height of the slope of this embankment segment, such that the stones along Manila Ave and a wraparound on 6th Street shall be incorporated into the wall where they are present now. Um, so they, you have that requires them to keep that wraparound. It doesn't quantify how much they have to go but in order to make that feasible you can't just like have one stone on either side you need to go a little bit beyond that in order for it to be feasible and be structurally sound thanks Mal. are there any other questions from commissioners I might be more comfortable if there was uh, something like a significant portion instead of just and a portion, uh, you know, and that would maybe, maybe we don't quantify a specific number, but it's not like, oh, a portion, you know, like you said, it can't just be a stone, but, you know, what's a portion and, you know, something that, that strikes and that just a little bit, something like significant or a similar word uh, might, might strengthen that and make, make it a little stronger. We can take that and see how that works. Are there any other questions, comments? 
I suppose yeah. maybe now is a good, I don't know if you want to do public testimony and uh, maybe we'd hear some of this, but I don't know if either of you want to give a brief recap from Wednesday's, I think it was Wednesday's meeting with the community and what the feedback was out of that. Sure, so I can give you kind of uh, just a background on the engagement so far in general. So we had our first community meeting May 18th of 2022. And that was actually focused primarily on the development side of the redevelopment plan. So this, the focus of that meeting was for the block one development as contemplated. And then there will be a small project on block seven, which you'll hear about in a couple of weeks. Um, so we had great attendance. A, a little over a hundred people attended that meeting virtually. Um, and we did do some polling uh, within Zoom. So you can do kind of like a quick survey and people can select some answers. And that was where we first tested this idea of going from a two tower configuration on the block to a one tower configuration on the block. Um, at that point in time, we were talking about actually a much higher density, um, a building up to 55 stories. So it was a little bit different, but there was uh, majority support to, to move to a one tower configuration. It was a little bit over 70% of the people who responded to the poll were in favor of allowing for a one tower configuration as opposed to a two tower configuration. Now the project that's come back is a reduced version of that one tower configuration because they are using the existing zoning. So it's a, a lower density than what was discussed at that meeting and a lower height. So when we met with the community last week, it was September 7th, um, we did provide them a full update of how there's kind of now this bifurcated approach of block one remaining in this Lewis Marin plan that they were utilizing their existing zoning rights and um, that they would like to pursue the one tower configuration at a lower height and density. Um, and then we also introduced the uh, amend the new plan for blocks two through eight. In general, the vast majority of public comment had to do with the new plan. So the vast majority of the comment was on just the idea of the parks and open space system for blocks two through eight. Um, and it, there weren't really there wasn't really any major comments on uh, the scope of what's before you tonight, meaning the block one changes. I think everybody um, was pretty clear that there would be a one tower configuration coming forward if the amendments went through, that it was at a lower height and density than what was originally discussed. And uh, there wasn't really any remaining questions or comments on the development side of things from that. All right, thank you, Mallory. Mm -hmm. All right, so if there's no more questions from commissioners, I think uh, we should open us up to public comment. All right, if there are any members of the public in attendance tonight who would like to speak regarding this application or really proposal, uh, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. If you're on the phone, you can press star nine. Okay, uh, staff sees no hands raised, so I would recommend a motion to open and close public comment. Make a motion to open and close public comment. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. All right. Do you guys have any lingering thoughts, questions? Um, I will just, I, I don't, we didn't really get this far. The staff recommendation is um, to make a motion to approve the amendments to this redevelopment plan. Um, we feel pretty confident with the language that we propose that we'll be able to retain as much of the historic embankment structure on block one as is feasible with the development plan. Um, and we are hopeful that <laughs> between this and the forthcoming redevelopment plan for blocks two through eight, that we'll actually be able to see some movement on this very long awaited project. And did you say, um, Mallory, did you say earlier that um, this now with the, the blocks to the west when going to the planning board will be heard at the same time? Correct. Yeah. So originally, uh, like I said, we were we had kind of like a one meeting offset between the two plans. But because um, we actually have to have alternative counsel at planning board, it was uh, it made more sense to have that person cover one meeting. So both of these plans right now are envisioned to go before planning board at the October 11th meeting. And we're planning, Maggie, you said we're planning for the first October meeting before that date to hear the rest of the uh, embankment. So the planning yes. will hear this all as one package. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
and the original, like Mallory said, the original scheme was for us, us to hear this, planning board to hear this, and then for us to go back for two through eight, and then planning board to go back through two, two through eight, and then we're scheduling at the council is kind of up to the council, but uh, that is not quite going to shake out for planning board, but it gives us the opportunity to review these as really the two separate parts that they are. All right. I'll make a motion to, I guess I'll make a motion to recommend this to the planning board. Yeah, it would, so this, yes, let me just, before we do that, it, it is, uh, in this particular case, um, it is just a motion to make a recommendation for adoption to the planning board um, because it is just a recommendation and it is not a certificate of appropriateness. We only need a simple majority on this. So in this particular case, because there are six people hearing this, we would need four. Second. I will take a roll call. All right, Commissioner Gucciardo is absent. Commissioner Stango is absent. Commissioner Sakong is recused. Um, Commissioner Amatuzo. Aye. Commissioner Lewis. Aye. Commissioner Gordon. Aye. Commissioner Gunther. Aye. Vice Chair Sankin. Aye. And Chairman Blazak. Aye. All right, there are six votes in favor, no nays, and one abstention. The proposed amendments to the redevelopment plan are recommended to the planning board. Thanks, all. Thank you, Thanks, Mallory. Mallory. Have a good night. You too. Mm -hmm. All right, so Brian, now we pop back up to old business. Yeah, you wanna re-promote Austin? Yes. So the next item is 8A, this is H21573, Joseph Cotta, Esquire, on behalf of 215 Warren LLC owner. This is 215 Warren Street, Block 14202, Lot 22, in the Paulus Hook Historic District. This is for a certificate of appropriateness for the construction of a new four-story, three-unit building and associated site work at 215 Warren Street, park, currently a parking lot. This is a recommendation to the Jersey City Planning Board and is carried from the regular HPC meeting of June 13th, 2022. Um, so I do see one. Hi. 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 I, had, um, I see one additional hand raised for John Clark. Is he? Hi. Uh, he's. It's not necessary. He was, um, he, he's an attorney for my firm. I, oh, I, oh. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you, Joseph. Oh, uh, boy. Uh, I don't hey, could you repeat that, please? No, J Mr. Clark is, is uh, one of my colleagues who was going to cover for me tonight, but I made it back in time. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. Um, so before we get started, um, I do want to note for the record, we had two commissioners who are present tonight who were not at the original June meeting. Um, I would like, Tony or Austin, did you guys read the transcript for this? I, I, I did, did read that, Maggie. I read the whole thing. Okay. Awesome. Yes, did I. All right. Um, Joe, if you would feel comfortable with the two of these commissioners voting, given that they have... Uh, affirm that they've read the transcript for the previous hearing? Uh, yes, that's okay. All right. So with that, uh, Nicole, you should be able to share your screen. Actually, okay. I'm sorry, we have to re-swear you in. Oh, okay, no that. problem. Would you raise your right hand to be sworn? Yep. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And if you could state and spell your full name for the record? Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E, Robertson, R-O-B-E-R-T-S-O-N. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you should be good to share now, Nicole. Okay, great. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you so much for um, allowing us to present uh, tonight our revised proposal since the last uh, meeting back in June. 
um, which I think was a very helpful, uh, very helpful discussion. And I think we've made um, a lot of changes since then that I hope are, um, you know, responsive to, to all of the comments. We really tried to listen carefully and I think we've done that. Um, so I'll just go through uh, the revised plans. Um, I think one of the things that I'd like to mention first is that we did kind of step back because um, we were struggling a bit to um, sort of resolve this new structure um, and its adjacency, you know, location at the corner and its adjacency to, you know, a very strong line of townhouses on Warren Street. And we looked back into the um, historic uh, records, specifically the plat maps of Jersey City from I believe the date of these maps is 1919. That was what I was able to um, find. And we were able to locate, um, uh, and actually I should say that previously we were not able to find one of the tax photos that so often serves as a really great reference for um, what was on the site. And as you know, this lot is currently vacant. It's been a parking lot for some time. Um, but we did go back into the historic plat maps and found um, this block. And, you know, we can see the very characteristic row of um, town brownstones along Warren Street. And then um, the proposed, uh, you know, our lot at the corner of Warren and Sussex. We were um, surprised to find um, that there was uh, uh, this, this um, figure ground drawing that showed uh, coverage over the site, um, basic almost 100% coverage, not that we're proposing that tonight at all, but um, what it allowed us to do was to kind of rethink the relationship that the proposed structure would have to um, the existing uh, brownstones along Warren Street, because we were, we were certainly having some issues um, resolving the facade and some of the um, arrangement of the facade elements. So that was um, an important factor in our rethinking of this project that we're presenting tonight. And I think it really um, helped us and um, in, in kind of resolving these issues in that we basically moved the, um, the proposed building footprint. We were able to move it a few feet forward towards Warren Street, um, allowing us to create an alignment with the adjacent two-story building here. So we have now, um, I think a very positive alignment with our rear yard. Um, so we've reduced the rear yard uh, setback uh, that we're um, requesting from, or I'm sorry, we've, we've, we've enlarged the rear yard setback to 24 foot eight inches, whereas previously we were um, proposing 22 feet. So we've created a larger rear yard and we've um, shifted the building forward so that it really sits um, more proud of the adjacent uh, Brownstones, and I think what was effective about that um, was that, and, and I'll go into this in the facade revised facade design, but it did allow us to um, assert the corner as um, something different, and while still kind of being mindful of the relationship to the adjacent buildings, we didn't have to um, match it, um, and you know because that was creating a little bit of a, a conflict. Um, the other thing I want to point out, so so I should mention that the, the building now aligns at the back or, or at the rear with the adjacent two-story structure, and we pulled it forward three foot six inches. Um, so we're still leaving a private yard at the front, um, and we've added some landscaping, which was one of the comments. Um, previously, there was, you know, there were basically pervious pavers. Um, there. Now we have uh, some, some planting areas, planting beds. And the other element that um, is important, an important change here that was discussed during the meeting was um, the relationship between the, the long facade that we have along Sussex Street, where we're going to have, you know, a ground floor level unit, and that there was a kind of lack of privacy and a sort of buffer um, between that dwelling unit and the sidewalk. And so what we're proposing is a kind of green uh, landscaped area that's three foot six wide um, that would be fenced and would extend beyond the property line. So it is a, you know, would require a franchise agreement with the city, but we think it's a very um, positive addition to the site. And, um, you know, the existing site actually has a chain link fence that is over the, um, 
the property line. The site plan um, actually shows this. So, um, you know, there is that relationship between this uh, uh, parking lot and the sidewalk. The sidewalk is already um, narrowed by that. We're proposing less of less width there. Um, this is a photo actually of what, what that looks like. Um, but the proposed design is, uh, we're showing a green buffer as a way to um, create privacy for the ground floor unit, as well as um, just add more green to the neighborhood. And it's also something that we've seen around the neighborhood um, frequently done uh, to, to have this green buffer. Um, okay, so, uh, so the plan has essentially stayed the same, except that we've shifted uh, the building forward uh, a bit. Um, reducing the front yard, as I said, increasing the rear yard. Um, but the plan itself has has essentially uh, remained the same. We still have a, a storage space on at the lowest level in the front massing, a utility room accessed by um, a gate through the fence and a small door, which I think we've also resolved much more successfully on the facade, I'll we'll share um, shortly. And the plan remains the same. So we have a duplex unit at the rear, um, on floors one and two. And then we have a triplex uh, unit at the front of the building, which is three stories plus that um, lower uh, cellar space or not cellar, uh, storage space. And then at the floors three and four, we have um, a three bedroom duplex at the rear, which starts at the third floor and um, extends to you know the fourth floor as well. And then has access to a, um, to a roof deck. And um, I'm not gonna, I, I won't go into, to repeat this again. I mean, it's a, the roof decks remain as previously proposed. The mechanical units are screened um, from site. We have sight lines that um, show how, how we've been able to achieve that. Um, what we really focused on in the redesign of, of our proposal here was obviously many, there were many comments about um, the, the um, how our proposed building would relate to the existing um, the existing context. And so we um, we studied the uh, facade at Warren Street uh, very closely. And I think um, our original design actually was uh, replicating the three window bays that we observed on in the townhouses along Warren Street. Uh, we actually, you know, I think the comment was that the everything felt too large, and we agreed with that. Um, so by increasing the number of bays to four bays, because it is a wider lot, um, we were able to create narrower, more elegant windows that match the proportion and size of the windows along Warren Street, and I think creates a, a more refined um, facade. Um, this shadow that we're casting here is showing really that um, our facade on Warren Street is forward of the adjacent brownstones by three foot six. Um, and I think what's you know successful about that is that we're not trying to match exactly the existing cornice um, along Warren that is, is so strong, but we're proposing a modern interpretation of the cornice. Um, it's a metal, uh, a metal cornice with, um, uh, we have some detailing of vertical uh, a kind of vertical articulation that lands on the center line between the windows and then um, holes that are uh, basically uh, replicating the rhythm of the corbels that are seen on the existing cornices. <laughs> on Sussex Street, uh, we continued that window proportion and um, made, you know, a, a more kind of opaque um, facade uh, uh, closest to Warren Street. And then we have a band of uh, glass that kind of separates the first and, or the, the front massing from the uh, rear massing on this, on this facade. And that's uh, also in proportion with the, what we observe to be um, two bay wide, um, two bay wide townhouses along Sussex Street, which was a repeated rhythm that I can show in, in, a, in a diagram shortly. Um, so our facade on Sussex Street is composed of um, first a, a, a rhythm of three bays and then a portion of two bays wide, then four and then two. 
And then there's the void space created by the rear yard um, setback. This drawing also shows how um, the, uh, the franchised uh, green buffer space along Sussex Street would be enclosed by um, a, a, an iron or steel, black steel fence um, with vertical posts, a modern interpretation of that and um, gates in order to access the utility the utility room located here, which we've aligned with the adjacent windows was one of the other comments. And we also added, um, uh, we also added light fixtures along Sussex Street. So um, it just creates a kind of safer and uh, more uh, friendly environment on the street. And then this is the rear facade. Um, facing the rear yard, uh, not not towards the public face. Uh, this one hasn't changed too much, except that we've uh, carried the um, cornice. Uh, we have a kind of detail here, introducing a kind of intermediate cornice that um, relates to the height of the existing townhouses along Sussex Street. And then we've stepped this volume uh, at the fourth floor back a little bit just to create that kind of um, articulation and relationship to the existing context. Um, and this actually is a, is a drawing that we did add um, to this, uh, showing the uh, north facade that is projecting forward of the adjacent townhouses on Warren Street. It's very simple uh, brick uh, facade. And here the cornice itself is, uh, we're not doing a full cornice here. We noticed in the neighborhood that, you know, any of these kind of really secondary facades were had a much simpler um, treatment in contrast to the primary facade. This drawing has not changed. Um, this is a detail of what that cornice, our modern cornice design looks like, where we are still projecting um, the top portion forward. And then we have um, three inch diameter holes with a wire mesh behind to keep the, any creatures out. Um, but the proportions of the cornice are aligned with the proportions of the um, cornices existing on the, um, on the block. We also um, revisited the design of the um, entry stair to bring in some of this uh, detail. So the details are, um, you know, we're using um, black uh, metal um, with a kind of modern interpretation of the ornament that relates to you know, the cornice design and just creates a kind of special um, experience at the entry. And um, I'm gonna go, let's see, I, we have a few renderings that show what this looks like. Actually, before I do that, these are some diagrams that um, maybe I should have started with this, but um, these diagrams show how we uh, drew the existing context. Um, so along, uh, Warren Street, we have a rhythm of the three bay windows, and then we have our proposed design, which is um, really in keeping with the proportion of the windows um, and the uh, reinforcing the fact that it is a wider, it's, it's a wider lot, um, so it has four bays. And then we have the Sussex Street elevation, which has a, a, a series of um, two bay wide townhouses, which we're trying to pick up on that in the design of our facade by breaking up our long facade on Sussex Street into um, uh, sort of masses or um, material uh, articulation that um, is reflective of this kind of difference that we that we observed on, this, on um, Sussex Street. And then what's this? And this is a um, rendered view that we created that shows um, what our proposed uh, design looks like. So we're keeping, um, you know, the uh, proposing a fiber cement board base, which looks, um, has a similar feel to um, the existing uh, 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 stone um, bases on the blocks. And then we have our red brick, which is very similar. Um, we are articulating the windows with a modern detail, but we have uh, revised this detail. I, there were many comments that the detail previously was overly simple. Um, so we've created more of an expression of a, of a head and sill in keeping with you know, what we observed on the block. 
And then our side view along Sussex Street, also we've used materials to reinforce the organization of this facade into four different uh, kind of uh, masses, the three, the, the three wide kind of townhouse, then a kind of uh, two bay wide uh, void space, and then a four by what, four wide, and then a two, and then our void space at the rear yard. And then we have, um, these are uh, our rendered views that show the proposed, um, proposed building in the context. And this is this is the view looking. So this is the view looking um, at the corner of Warren and Sussex, looking um, kind of west, uh, northwest, and then looking from Sussex Street um, northeast. And I think that I think that was yeah. These are just shadow studies that we did, but I think I'll leave it at this. Um, Tried to summarize it quickly, but happy to go back if um, you have any questions. <clears throat> um, Nicole, before we get to commissioner questions, can you just briefly touch on one of the things that the HPC had requested was that you guys go back to the neighborhood and discuss the project. Can you just oh, yes. touch on some of that, please? Yes, of course. Yeah, that was a big part of this redesign. Absolutely was um, having um, conversation with Diane Hayes, who was extremely helpful. Um, her feedback was great, and we were able to work through, um, you know, the community's, the neighborhood's concerns. Um, and she, I, I believe, was in support of this um, adjustment um, to the building footprint uh, for the very reason I, I mentioned that it really did help with resolving the relationship between between the new um, the new structure and the existing townhouses. So we had we had a very good dialogue about it. And I think I think this is the result of, of, of that conversation. Great, thanks. Are there any commissioner questions about the revisions to the project? Uh, I had just one question. I think first I think this is much improved. Um, and I think it's much more harmonious with the rest of the block, both on Warren and on Sussex. Um, the only thing I wanted to ask about is the corner here, uh, the, the basement or ground floor, I guess it would be, is uh, you're using a fiber cement board, which I think yeah. is perfectly fine and appropriate on the, the left there of the uh, kind of looking at it as like a secondary building. Um, to me, I, I still think that choice is maybe a little, maybe you can explain your choice uh, for that material um, and that location. Uh, I, I'm just trying to think of like, you know, are there other examples of three stories of brick masonry with like a wood clad or, or a, uh, a siding at the basement floor? I think maybe usually you see kind of the opposite where you see masonry kind of at the basement and then uh, something else above. So I mean, my thought is maybe to do something like a cast stone or even something like a stucco finish. Um, but I'll let you kind of explain the reasoning, uh, Nicole. For yeah, that. I mean, I, I agree. I mean, we were trying to limit the material palette so we didn't have too much going on. There's definitely, um, you know, we have the brick and then we have a, a dark gray fiber cement, as you mentioned on the rear. Um, volume and then we're using the lighter fiber cement board above and we just you know we were looking for a light gray material for the base that would be you know similar in feel to um you know the light gray that we see at on many of the bases of the building but you know the existing structures in the neighborhood but um I, yeah, I mean, it could be a cast stone um, as al alternately, but I think we've just felt that there were a lot of different materials happening. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so does that answer? Yeah, I think I think that answers it. You want to kind of keep yeah. it cool. Um, and I, I don't know if any other commissioner would agree. Um, 
with, with me on that. If if everyone else is fine with the fiber cement there, I'd, I'd be fine with it as well, but I'd also support maybe that being modified to just change that material if, if other commissioners uh, supported that as well. And that, that was really my only comment other than, I, I, again, I think this is greatly improved and much more harmonious with the rest of the block. All right, my daughter didn't get the message that the meeting agenda changed. Okay. <laughs> I apologize. Was uh, I'll, I'll just jump in. Um, I, I, having reviewed the previous application and the, uh, and the transcript, I agree that it's, it's uh, hugely improved. So thank you for this presentation. I think the additional line of windows on the Warren Street facade makes a huge uh, improvement. It makes it much more elegant, I think. Um, and I think the, that that header and lint, the um, header and sill detail is a beautiful, it just kind of gives it a little bit more heft in a, in a modern yeah. way. So I appreciate that. I was actually wondering why the bottom, bottom row um, of windows on the Western brick volume along Sussex um, didn't have that same detail it seemed a little odd um, to just sort of switch it up on that bottom floor windows. Um, I, I'd like to suggest that it should have that de same detail. It you know towards the towards the point of like you know fewer fewer moves the better. Um, that said, I, I do support Commissioner Blazak's um, comment about a, uh, having a cast stone base. Um, while I sympathize with with the desire to limit the materials, I, I I do think fiber cement, especially on the corner that prominent, might not be appropriate. And then I'll I'll just my my last comment I'll just say is is the expansive glass um in the the kind of void slot between the two brick volumes, um, in 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 the abstract I don't mind it I I think it's 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 a nice um, break, <laughs> um, no pun intended. I just worry because it's a south facing exposure and and given your son's studies, I worry that it, it'll never look like that. I think it'll always have shades down. I think it, it'll just always kind of, you know, people inside will just always be pre preventing a greenhouse um, inside. So uh, I, was, I was just wondering if you have any thoughts as to controlling the the internal shading mechanism to have to make sure it's um, not all over the place um, when they're inevitably down for most of the day. I mean, I think what, what we plan to do first, it's it's one, it's gonna be one owner. And um, what we had planned to do, because it is, you know, all one townhouse. Um, and what we had planned to do was uh, roller shades, like solar roller shades that would be um, concealed in a in a pocket detail at the interior. And um, you know, those have a really nice, clean look. Um, I agree with you. Like we would hate to see, you know, uh, lots of different things happening through that glass, but that was something that we had discussed um, with the owner was that that would be an integral detail for the architecture. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be a kind of add on, um, you know, by whomever purchases the property. We would, we would want to make sure that that is um, an element that's you know, really considered as part of the facade. So, you know, it could be set at different heights, but I think would still, it can still be done as one piece and could be, you know, um, fairly regular. In, in which case, it, it, yeah, since you describe it as part of the facade, I, um, if we vote on this tonight, I'd like to propose that you submit um, a sample or color um, or in a spec of that shade. Um, sure. The yeah. Rest of yeah, that, that's, we, we could certainly do that. I mean, it would be something that has, you know, some translucence yeah. to it, but simple. Yeah, sure. I will echo uh, Chairman Blazak and Commissioner Sakong's comments that I think that this design is a very large improvement. It's largely responsive to the comments from the last meeting where we discussed this application. Um, one of my few remaining concerns is um, I wanted to ask about the volume or dimensions of the building. Uh, typically what I see happening is the developer comes in and dreams big. They go as big as they feel like they can. And then there's some horse training that often goes on and we end up 
paring the project down a little bit or a lot, depending on what the applicant is proposing. Here, it looks like you've actually, with your revised plans, increased the square footage of the building by about 81 feet. I think one of the ways in which you accomplish that, if I understood correctly, is that the rear yard setback is increasing by a little over two feet, but the front of the building is moving forward more than three feet. Do I understand that correctly? So Ms. Robertson, you're oh, mute. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, <laughs> I um, had that off. Uh, so actually, so the original proposed area of the ground floor was um, 1,621 feet. And the proposed area of the new design is um, 17 square feet more. I mean, obviously that translates up um, the height of the building. So overall it is larger, but we're, um, I think in order to make the front, um, the expression at the front, I mean, if it were totally equal, I don't, it, what we were trying to do was capture that three foot six dimension was really driven by um, the entrance. So we're creating, I'm gonna go to the first floor plan to show that um, right here. So what we were doing with that three foot dimension, three foot six dimension, um, that's the amount that we were projecting past the, um, the previous proposal was really capturing a covered um, landing for the steps. Um, that landing, you know, we think is that's the appropriate size for it. Three feet wouldn't quite be enough. Um, we wanted to make it generous enough that it's comfortable. And so that's what was really driving that. So it does end up being a little bit bigger, but um, you know, that's balanced with, um, you know, just the, I mean, we don't want to set back this part of the facade though either, you know, so it does, it does translate into um, an overall increase in the volume. And I don't have uh, any problem with a slight increase in the volume if that's what's appropriate, but that, brings me to the, the Sussex facade of the building. Um, mm -hmm. That line of the building, that is not moving from the prior proposal, is that right? The rear, the rear line of the building is moving. Yeah, we were previously at 22 feet. So the rear, the rear uh, facade has moved two foot eight. The, the Southern facade I'm referring to now, uh, fronting Sussex. No, that has not moved because the building is already quite narrow and it's um, it's on the property line. So the property, no, we have not um, made it narrower. Right, so uh, one of the concerns that was raised was that um, you were right up against the property line and that might create concerns about privacy and potentially exposing the building to vandalism. Um, so now you're proposing this franchise onto uh, the sidewalk. Um, this might be something where I would have to direct the question to staff because I'm not familiar with how that process works, um, how easy it is to obtain that, and what would be the backup plan if for any reason that is denied by the city. Um, does the application then come back to us? Does our recommendation here impact the likelihood of obtaining that approval? What does that look like? So we'll, we can discuss it more in staff comments, um, but if, so one of the conditions that we'd put on this project was that if that franchise agreement were to be approved, but had changes or that franchise uh, agreement was not approved and therefore required a change to the site plan, um, they would need to come back to the HPC or seek approval from HPC staff to spending on the, depending on the scope of the changes. So obviously a more so something like the franchise agreement not being approved and therefore requiring a pretty major change to the site plan would likely need to come back to the HPC. But if it was a smaller amendment, just you know, like a 
small reduction in space or something like that, we might be able to do that at the staff level. Of course, that's just a recommended condition. If you guys wanted to discuss that further during staff comments and figure out something that works for you guys, we can do that then. Thank you, Maggie. And, and so, um, Ms. Robertson, you said because the building is is already quite narrow, it's not feasible to, to move the building any further north or you know, well, tighten it. I mean, I also think if you look at where the adjacent buildings are, the, um, the block plan, I believe we're aligning with um, the existing buildings along Sussex Street. And as it's a corner lot, I think it would be, I don't know. I mean, I think maintaining that alignment with um, with the townhouses along Sussex Street makes sense um, urbanistically. I'm gonna go to the block plan actually. Um, I mean, I think that is our intent to maintain that, that line as well. So it wasn't really, I don't know. I mean, at a corner lot, I think it's more common almost to see them projected further. And I think the, um, the historic map as well shows an alignment with the existing uh, buildings that are on Sussex Street as well. And I don't think we're trying to take advantage of this diagram either. You know, I mean, we're not proposing to uh, make a building footprint that replicates what's shown on this on this map, even though there seems to be a precedent for it. Um, but, you know, I think an important part of this representation is that the buildings, you know, do um, carry this alignment around the corner. And actually on Warren Street, um, it projects quite far, um, actually. And we're not taking that full projection because we felt it was important to maintain a front yard. Um, we thought that was a positive for the neighborhood. Um, you know, so we feel that we, we didn't consider pulling it back because we, we didn't really feel it worked um, with the overall block plan. I find that explanation persuasive. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I have a question for you, um, Ms. Robertson. Yeah. And this is pertaining to the lighting um, that you have um, in the plan. Uh, it looks like you have light fixtures that kind of wrap both um, facades of the building. And I'd like you to talk about, number one, the need for that many light fixtures and um, what type will they be? And will they just be like your standard you know, old fashioned light, or will they be light fixtures that uplight the building, um, which I find to be distracting on a lot of new construction. Um, everyone's uplighting the entire facade of the building. Um, so I, I, I'm curious about that. Yeah, no, we, we definitely don't want to uplight the building. We're just proposing these um, very kind of low profile down lights that are square in shape. And um, I think one of the concerns that was brought up at the at the hearing, um, you know, that are in our June hearing was that there was not enough light on Sussex Street. So we did add um, these lights along Sussex as well as on the front of, of the building. Um, we, in, at the entrance, we eliminated um, the sconce that we had previously proposed and at the front entrance on Warren Street, we're proposing a recessed down light now that we have um, a covered uh, landing, which we thought was was really nice. But the windows or the um, light fixtures we're proposing are, are very low profile. Um, we're definitely not looking to, you know, um, illuminate this structure in any, um, in any kind of you know, obnoxious way. I mean, we have five five lights that are evenly spaced. Um, mm -hmm. So. Okay, I just, uh, um, yeah. I, I understand. And my one question is, um, do you feel that there should be a light at that side entrance door 
<laughs> which goes to your utility room. Um, yeah. I feel like a doorway should be illuminated if you need to get in there at nighttime. Um, and it also distinguishes that, yes, this is where the door is, where the other lights along the side are just saying, we're here to light the facade up. But um, I don't know, it's just typically how, you know, historically, yeah. how, you know, you'd have a light fixture by a door and not plastered in the middle of the building. Yeah, I think that was an oversight. Um, I agree with you. There should definitely be a light there. Um, I think that the thing is, then we would probably want to eliminate this one. Um, and if you feel there's too many, you know, I, I think we, we were trying to evenly space them, um, you know, to just create. I just don't know that they have a, a real purpose. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you look around the rest of the neighborhood, no one has the sides of their buildings lit up every however many feet you have them placed every 10 or 15 feet um, it's just not something that you see mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it may just add a little bit of a distraction to the neighborhood um, I, I'm, I'm always happy with just entrances having a light and mm -hmm. not any you know the the least amount of lights the better for me but uh, that's my personal take I don't know what anyone else thinks about it but um, that was just my uh, curiosity. I think if 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 there's a feeling that we don't want as many light fixtures, it's it's really not a problem for us to um, eliminate those. You know, we could just have one by the door. I think that would be fine. I just I believe there was discussion at the last meeting about um, about not having enough light and about the kind of safety. Um, any kind of safety issues along Sussex Street, and that those lights would be helpful in that way. Um, but you know, if if we have this buffer zone, maybe those are not really necessary. Um, right, we'll have planting there, planting uh, space as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Um, yeah. But overall, I think the design is way better than the first uh, incarnation. Um, it definitely flows better and relates better to um, the other buildings on Sussex Street. And I also like the fact that you did pull the building forward um, in front of the Warren Street buildings to not try and compete and to have a distinguished difference between them. Um, I like that um, very much. Thank you. I'll take responsibility for the... Uh being the one who recommended the lights at the last meeting <laughs> and as you said mr robertson if uh if there's this buffer space on the sussex side then that right. probably eliminates the concern i had if however yeah. uh for any reason that franchise is not granted then we might want to revisit the question of having lighting and then i suppose there's also a question of whether there's any nearby street lighting uh, I don't know the answer. Uh, I believe there is the street lamp. This is not my, no, that's a demo plan. Um, trees, the street light. Um, is Edwin? I actually know there's no street light, surprisingly. Um, there's no existing street light, and I don't believe we have one proposed. So I trust Commissioner Amatuzo's judgment on this. If uh, if we have that buffer space, then I would agree with his recommendation. But again, if the franchise is not granted, then it might be appropriate to revisit the question. Okay. Okay. That's fine. If that makes sense. Trying to get to the rendering. Okay. 
So we'll remove, we can remove the, the lights except for a light at the doorway. I just think it would be more appropriate for site and setting, um, but that would sure. be great. Okay. Yeah, point taken. Sure. I have one question about um, the proposed fence around the public thoroughfare to create the buffer zone. Um, yeah. It just looks a little dense in this rendering. Can we look more closely at what the details are and can this fence be sort of opened up more? Because I'm, I'm presuming that that's part of our approval if we are voting on that, even though we don't have the power to grant the franchise. Yes, it is still part of your approval. So the design of the fence is, um, it's, it's really like a kind of modern picket fence, um, but the pickets are, comprised of uh, steel plates that are turned, I guess, 90 degrees. Um, so the effect is um, like this. This is a taller version of it, but at the um, franchise, you know, the kind of green buffer zone planted area, um, it's only four feet tall, but this is the idea so that as you move along the fence, it, you know, it changes the way that you perceive it when you're looking straight on at it, it's more open. When you're walking on the street, it you know, is more dense, but then opens up as you pass it. So it just creates more variation and interest. And then at the, yeah, so that's, that's the proposed design. You can kind of see it um, here in, um, in section. So those plates are rotated um, 90 degrees. rendering. I mean, from this view, it's the same detail, but I think this image kind of shows how, you know, looking at the building from across the street, um, it appears more open. So it's really just about, you know, the direction that you're viewing the fence from. You know, I mean, I appreciate sort of the modern interpretation of fence mm -hmm. and the detailing. I just wonder if the members aren't a little too deep and it, it starts mm -hmm. to look wall-like, you know, instead mm -hmm. of like mm -hmm. a fence. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely more of it. Uh, I mean, in this rendering, I, I, I agree with you. I think it looks very dense in this representation. Um, Is that accurate, how it's gonna look like from an angle? I mean, this, this was a little bit of a quicker uh, rendering, but I mean, it, yeah, I mean, it does feel pretty dense in this point of view, especially because there's just so much more of it than we had previously proposed. Because um, it was really only previously at the front and the rear. Now we have it along the entire side. So, um, you know, I it actually, might make sense. Yeah. I, I actually think that the graphic is doing you a disservice. I, yeah. I, I wonder if there's a lot of lines here that yeah. are um because if if they're if they're four inches on center and they're only yeah. a quarter inch thick. Yeah. I think Commissioner uh, I think Commissioner Gunther's point is actually about the three inch depth, not less the quarter mm -hmm. inch width. Mm -hmm. But um I, I I I think there's something between the kind of area view that you had only frontally looking, so mm -hmm. not quite as black as right. what's being drawn here. That's that's actually the reality. Right. right. But it's just just for just for reference, is there a code issue at all, or it's purely aesthetic, the four inch um, spacing? Actually, there really is not a code issue at grade for this. Um, so, you know, I mean, that that, that code is really for guardrails. Right. It's driven by, you know, preventing right. someone from falling through it. So in this case, I think we could uh, widen the space between 
um, that's one solution, or we could make, as you said, the, you know, from three inches, you know, if we reduce that um, depth of, of those plates, I mean, I, yeah, it, it is coming across pretty dense here, but it could be, it could be just the, you know, there's just a lot of lines. Um, but no, it's not, I don't think it's a code issue. So we could, we could widen that to lighten it up. I mean, I, I think it seems to me a more more of an engineering issue. Like, you know, can you can you get the stiffness and the connections that you need? Three inches. I mean, yeah. my own experience, three inches seems a little bit deep. Mm -hmm. um, my guess is that you could whittle that down, mm -hmm. um, and you know, just the percentage of you know the percentage from three to two yeah. and a half would actually make a huge difference in right kind of opening it up. But I also don't want to claim that I've done the, you know, the engineering <laughs> on it. So I, you know. Yeah, no, but, but I think like if the depth, if the, if the space, if the void space is four inches and the depth is, you know, reduced to say two inches, would that, you know, that proportion, would that allow for, you know, the right level of, of openness? I think, you know, maybe, you know, like 75% is what we have now, if you see it, I guess at, at the right angle. I'm not sure exactly how the how the math works on it, but um, yeah, I mean, I think we could we could certainly look at reducing the depth of those members or or the spacing between them to um, lighten it visually. But I agree. I mean, I think this, you know, uh, this this representation does look rather dense. So maybe we can make it a condition to work with staff on the final um, details on the fence to make it a little bit more opaque maybe more just maybe making a mock-up section out of wood that won't be very expensive you can buy one by threes and mm -hmm. make a mock-up out of wood to see what the actual you know um, effect of it is and my other question is uh our open pickets at the top um allowed by code or do they have to have a top rail on it i mean i think all throughout the historic district there's lots of um open pickets on the fences um i mean we did put a top rail on the on the stair um handrail where we expect someone to be running their their hand but for these for this fence um you know, we, we do see precedents for this um, in the neighborhood where there's, you know, it's it's really a kind of sharp, actually something much sharper looking than this. I mean, I think, you know, um, we we thought the look of this was was good, and you know, I don't I don't believe there's a code requirement about it, but um, yeah, I'm just asking because I'm not sure either. Um, you know. Um, I don't think there is a code. I've never seen a top someone tell us that a top rail is required at a like an areaway fence like that. As far as I know, like at at, at an areaway specifically, I, I don't. Well, I, mean, I mean, picket fences usually. I mean, I've definitely seen examples around Paulus Hook where the the picket or it's got a little uh, spear on top, or you know. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this is a modern interpretation of that. Um, although we might ask the the metal worker to, you know, round round the edges a little or just soften it so it's not a hazard. But um, yeah, that's why I figured it might be cheaper to just put a cap on it and not have to have somebody round off all of those edges and make them non, you know, so that you someone can't impale themselves on it. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's just, uh, I know historically there were picket fences, but I don't think there were people were thinking about those kinds of things a hundred years ago if someone was going right. to, you know, safety, the safety issues that are involved yeah. in the litigation, you know, if someone does get hurt on your fence, um, right. uh, what didn't exist back then. <clears throat> hey, I mean, we, oh, sorry, Nicole. 
no, I was just going to offer that we could, you know, if it could be a condition of the approval that we work through the details with you and perhaps consider putting a top rail or, you know, addressing that concern and then the concern about the kind of degree of openness, uh, visual openness of the fence. Yeah. Um, certainly do that. Okay. Yep. Just added that into the condition I had starting here. Mm -hmm. All right. Are there any other questions, comments, concerns? All right. Um, Joe, Nicole, do you guys have anything left or is this, does this conclude your testimony? I think that's it for me. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's all just about the franchise agreement. Uh, the applicant has every intention of uh, building this as shown, but as you know, the franchise agreement's out of our hands. I mean, we're making every effort to get it. So I'm, you know, to, to have to come back, we, we would work with you if we weren't allowed to uh, put the green area on the side but it's very difficult to condition the whole project and have to change the whole building if, uh, if for whatever reason the city didn't give us an agreement. But I mean, right now, I think that the fence already encroaches on the sidewalk, so I'm very optimistic about the city. So. Great. All right, well, if that concludes your testimony and there are no other condition uh, commissioner questions, I think we can move to public comment on this. Um, if there are any members of the public in attendance who would like to speak regarding this application, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. If you're on the phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand. All right, staff sees no hands raised and recommends a motion to open and close. Public comment. Motion to open and close public comment. Second. Second. Okay, I have Janelle on that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, so we can move into staff comments for this application. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, so we'll skip on down to staff recommendations and comments. Just um, for the record, any changes that were made to the staff report are bold and italic. Um, similar to the commission, staff was very happy with this redesign proposal. Um, we had a lot of the same talking points as you guys that we thought it flowed better. We thought that it was a better interpretation of the existing historic standards. Um, and we were happy that it was brought to our attention that they could actually move the building forward and reduce that rear yard setback. Um, we, based on all of the design changes, oh, I'm sorry, we also are, uh, very happy that they were able to connect with uh, Historic Paul's Hook and work things out with them as well. Um, so following all of that, we are recommending that the commission approve a certificate of appropriateness with conditions and make a recommendation for approval to the planning board for this project. Um, we do have some conditions listed in the staff report. And then I also was keeping track of some of the conditions that you guys brought up during comments. Um, I'll get through the ones in the staff report first, and then I'll read what I have phrased, and we can kind of work some of those things out. Um, the first thing is actually a removal of a condition. Um, the first condition wanted the applicant to change from a thin brick to a full brick at the facade. Um, it was never a thin brick. I don't. I must have been reading a previous version when I, when I wrote that condition. Um, we have some standard conditions. Uh, and then moving to number four, number four covers that franchise agreement. Um, we we are in agreement with the applicant. We don't quite know if uh, why the city wouldn't approve it. Um, in this particular case, there is more than enough sidewalk space to accommodate that franchise agreement, those street trees and still have a full width sidewalk there. Um, so, but you know, things happen. So we uh, are proposing here that if there's any changes to the side yard, um, 
that there are a subjects to the terms of the franchise agreement and that if there's any changes to the proposed side yard as a result of either that franchise agreement being approved, being approved with some type of change to it or being denied, um, and there is a substantial change to the scope, they shall reappear at the HPC requesting a design deviation. Um, the phrase substantial change to the scope there is really the trigger. Um, we, there will be some things that we potentially might be able to work out on a staff level. But if you know there's a substantial change to the scope, like for example, that franchise agreement not being approved, they would come back to HPC. Um, we have a standard condition here that we added in that none of the rooftop appurtenances or roof, head, or roof deck bulkhead should be visible from the public right of way. They are not currently considered to be visible from the public right of way. Um, none of the sight lines show that they're gonna be visible, but we're just gonna add that in. Um, and then the, Prior to the submission of construction documents, uh, the applicant, she, uh, we just need that electrical service shown on where whichever facade it's going on. Um, just so when PSE and G tries to tell us to put it in a different place, we can bully them into the correct place. You know, I'm one of the, you, I mean, wherever it makes the most sense, honestly, and is the least obtrusive. So following that, we just have more standard conditions. Um, we, so I kept track as you guys were talking. Here, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, for some other conditions. So there was the proposed condition to revise the base material to be cast stone rather than fiber cement. Um, we had a condition to add the same window details to the bottom row on Sussex Street. We had for the applicant to submit a specification of the shade. Um, I added in uh, at the time of the submission of shop drawing, uh, shop drawings, um, at the time of submission of construction documents. We have a condition for any exterior light at the facade I added or at the roof deck shall be downcast in nature. I have a, a the applicant shall add a recessed downcast light fixture uh, to the the side utility door facing Sussex Street. And then we have the applicant shall work with staff to reduce the pickets and the proposed fencing to visually lighten it and to, and to consider adding a top rail. Um, the applicant shall create a mock-up of wood if they choose prior to fabrication to be submitted to HPC staff. How do we feel about those? So together with adding the light fixture to that door, we're also removing the other light fixtures around the perimeter of the building. But okay. um, as I had mentioned, in the event that the franchise agreement is not granted, then we would conceivably revisit that question. Okay. Just on the, the point that I had made earlier about that, adding that detail to those bottom row of windows, um, if there's a good reason to to do it the way that you drew it, as opposed to incorporating that detail, I'm, I'm open to striking that condition. Um, I, I just wanted to hear from you, Ms. Robertson, what, what, the, what the thinking was. You're on mute. Um, no, I think your comment makes sense. Um, I think we were trying to treat the windows at the base consistently, um, so they don't have that detail, but we ended up not doing the kind of uh, gray base. Right. The we we pulled the gray the... down. Yeah. But I think after you said that, I, I thought, you know, I think that really made sense to um, do that detail where we have the brick facade. Yeah. So Great. I think that's, that's perfectly good. Yeah. Thank you. Maggie, I just wanted to be clear well as the uh, in regards to the fence, if the open picket is fine by code, then that's fine by me. I just, you know, didn't know if it, if it was. And um, if not, obviously, you need to change it or put a top rail on it. But um, a top rail does not have to be a condition. Okay, I think that's something we can explore at the staff level. Because mm -hmm. I don't know if it's to code either. Great, thanks. Okay. Do we have any other changes, proposed changes, anything like that? 
How do we feel about those conditions and that recommendation? Are there any questions for staff? All right, um, hearing none. Again, the recommendation is to approve a certificate of appropriateness with conditions and to make a recommendation for approval to the planning board. I so move. Second. Okay, move to a roll call. Commissioner Gucciardo is absent. Commissioner Lewis? Aye. Commissioner Sakam? Aye. Commissioner Amatuzo? Aye. Commissioner Stango is absent. Commissioner Gordon? Aye. Commissioner Gunther? Aye. <clears throat> Aye. Vice Chair Sankam? Aye. And Chairman Blazak? Aye. All right, there are seven votes in favor, none against, no abstentions. The certificate of appropriateness with conditions and recommendation for approval to the planning board is approved. That's great. Thank you. Thanks so much, nice. everyone. Appreciate it. Bridget, do you want to take a five minute break? Yes, please. Okay. All right. Yeah, How about. Have a good so it's 827. Come back here at 832. All right. All right. Well, let's take a quick recess. Um, everyone, just remember to mute yourself and turn off your camera, and then at least turn on your camera on your backs. Great. My hope is yes. Oh, perfect. Wonderful. Great. All right. So it's eight thirty-five p.m. We're coming back from recess. Uh, I can read the next item into the record. Yes, please. Okay. Next item is 9B. This is H22403. This is for a review and recommendation of proposed amendments to Chapter 345-33 entitled Fees. This is a recommendation to the Jersey City Planning Board. Okay. Uh, it is a rare meeting that we have two ordinance amendments on, but here we are. Um, so this ordinance amendment is something that has kind of been coming down the pipeline for a little bit, and it is us revisiting some of uh, the HPC fees. So we, let me, um, you know, that's probably the best way to do this is for me to pull up the memo that I distributed to you guys. I'm going to skip a lot of the memo because a lot of this memo was written kind of to as an explainer to not only HPC, but also planning board and city council, as you'll see who it's addressed to. Um, so we are looking at what is essentially a complete overhaul of the HPC fee structure. Um, and to put it very bluntly, the reason we are doing that is because HPC makes almost no money. Um, we are not necessarily here to make money, but we, cannot even remotely begin to cover our costs. Um, and part of that is because the fees, to my knowledge, have not been updated since the ordinance was put into effect. I know we have updated a fee or two here or there, but for the most part, they have not been revisited since 2000. So the fees that we're looking at being updated are for cone applications, for, for COA applications, for demo permit applications, for determination of significance application, our special meeting fees, and we are looking to add a certificate of occupancy application fee. So I'm just gonna skip over some of the explainers because we are going to talk through them. Um, I will point out, well, I'm not gonna, unless you guys would like to, I'm not gonna go over it. Um, we did look at Newark's historic fees and Hoboken's historic fees as well while determining kind of the right place to put some of these fees. So here is the proposed new fee schedule. So the text that we're removing is a strike through and any new text is yellow. It probably makes the most sense for me to start off with the fees that are <laughs> not changing, um, which right now is an outdoor cafe, that fee is staying the same. So for the HPC to review an outdoor cafe, that is remaining at $100. Um, for full disclosure, the reason that's remaining at $100 is because that's also, we did uh, not we, um, the city put a substantial amount of work in a new sidewalk cafe and uh, parklet ordinance earlier this year 
that $100 is listed in that ordinance and I am not interested in also revising that one too. So this $100 fee is staying the same. Other than that, um, we, we, we spent a lot of time as staff kind of reviewing where the majority of our fees come from, what the majority of our fees are from, um, and kind of a, what we think is a more appropriate fee based on the amount of time we spend on each application. So starting with the certificate of no effect applications, let's start with these non-residential cone applications. So let me backtrack a little bit. Um, we, I have the actual numbers up here a little bit. So in 2020 and 2021, can you guys, I, can you guys see where I'm highlighting? Yes. Okay. So in 2020, cone applications were 93.5% of the total applications. And in 2021, cone applications were 95% of the total applications that came into HPC. So these are all staff reviews. The commission sees clearly but around six or 7% of everything gets submitted. So the vast majority of applications are cone applications. The time we spend on them kind of varies. Sometimes they are interior permit reviews that we review rather quickly and we're able to get off to the applicant. Sometimes we spend 40 hours on a cone, depending on the scope of the project. So the first type of cone we have is a non-residential cone. So that's any type of commercial space cone. This is for interior business fit out. This is for hair salons that need to do plumbing work to add a sink. This is for um, really any type of commercial business that is interior in nature, not a sign or conforms with our guidelines. So we chart in the past, it was $40 per 1,000 square feet or part thereof, meaning if the commercial space is 1,001 square feet, you're bumped up to the next fee structure. So we revised this to be 80 per 1,000 square feet, which is really just more reflective of the amount of time that we put into these um, commercial, uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say commercial, non-residential cone applications tend to take a little bit longer. Um, we find that commercial businesses are, for the most part, not all, are generally less familiar with um, our guidelines. And so we spend a little bit more time on those. Um, that this with principal building, without principal building. So it's most of the time it's with principal building. Very, very rarely do we see a non-residential without the principal building. So that would be something, you know, front yard, backyard, things like that. We very rarely see those, but that's also uh, proposed to be $80. An unlit window sign. So this would be really any unlit window sign. We see a lot of these final applications and windows, things like that. That would be $100. That fee is consistent with what Newark and Hoboken charge for the same type of work. Uh, and then we have just sidewalk repair when not concurrently filed with other work. Um, and that is $80 for the first 25 feet and then $40 for each 25 feet of frontage over that first 25 feet. Um, most places based on the uh, most common lot size in Jersey City are going to be at or under that 25 feet. Um, you'll really only see more than that 25 feet on a corner property. Residential. So this, uh, I'm going to stop highlighting things. It's not working for me. The residential fees are the vast majority of our fees. Um, currently, they are, to put it bluntly, extremely low. Um, we, it, it's almost artificially low. So for interior work, we have charged $10 per affected dwelling unit. So someone in a condo complex comes in and wants to replace their hot water heater. Um, it's, and it's for an individual unit, that's $10. Um, that maximum used to be $60. We have raised that, we're proposing to raise that to a hundred dollar maximum. So really any interior work is going to be $20 instead of $10. Exterior work or interior and exterior work filed concurrently. I went through all of the past three years of applications today, and this is the fee structure that is the most commonly filed, um, this exterior or interior and exterior at the same time. 
that in the past has been $20 per dwelling unit to a maximum of $750. Um, we are proposing for it to be $40 per dwelling unit to a maximum of $1,000. Um, and then we also have just individual sidewalk work by itself. And that's $40 per dwelling unit to a maximum of 200. This number flipped significantly because we would max out on these large sidewalks um, that you more often than not the, require so much more work than they seem, um, especially when there are historic, is there's historic fabric involved and it's not just concrete. Um, hey Maggie. Yeah. Just a quick question. Um, sure. I'm just comparing to the Newark and Hoboken um, fees. Uh, can you just confirm that the the unit of measurements are apples to apples? So, you know, for Newark non-residential, just says fifty dollars. It's per thousand square feet, and residential is per affected dwelling unit. To my knowledge, yes, Newark has a very similar fee structure to us. Hoboken's is more based on the type of work proposed, but Newark has follows a similar structure where it tends to be per unit and per uh, per square footage for non-residential properties. Um, Can I? Do you not, uh, that was, so I'm gonna stop here. Do we have specific questions about cones? We can also save everything to the end. I just had a follow-up question to Austin's, which is, um, my, I mean, the first question I had when I first looked at this was when was the last time we updated our fee structure because this represents a significant increase, but if it hasn't been updated in over, what did you say, 20 years, then that seems reasonable. Um, we're using Newark and Hoboken for comparative purposes. Do we know when they last updated their fee structures to make sure that their fee structures are up to date? Because obviously we're going through a period of significant inflation. Maybe we should actually be shooting a little bit higher than them. So I do not know the last time Newark updated theirs. I do know Hoboken is actively looking at updating theirs as well. So right. I'm, so I'm not 100% not sure where Newark stands. I would not be surprised if they would like to update theirs, but aren't capable of doing it right now. But I do know Hoboken is actively reviewing their fees. Right. So we're, we're updating ours to match theirs, and then they may simply increase it in the near future. Is that Has that been taken into consideration? Ours isn't matching theirs, right? I mean, no, it's so I it's to answer your question directly, Robert. No, I did not take that into consideration. Um, ours, and again, it, this is I, I don't want to read this memo into the record because a lot of it is frankly repetitive for you guys. You're here, you're reviewing these applications. Um, our proposed fees are more based on the amount of staff time it requires to review these applications more than it is um, matching what Hoboken and Newark do to be very frank as well. The way Hoboken and Newark approach preservation is also wildly different than us. Um, so we, theirs is more just we, <laughs> I don't think anyone wants to have the highest fees for preservation in the state. Um, and we just kind of wanted to make sure that we were in at least in line with what they were proposing, um, especially in some places like our COAs, we are significantly higher than they are from what I can tell at least. Okay, so this is just to illustrate that we are somewhat aligned with neighboring or local. Yeah, yeah, that's my intention is to illustrate that we're somewhat aligned. Um, and if I can ask another general question, um, yeah. do these fees become general city revenue or are they somehow earmarked for HPC's budget and would adopting the increased fees increase our resources? They are just city revenue. Ah. Yes. Um, yes. I will make a note to ask if there's specific allocations, but it, my understanding is that all of the division of city planning revenue goes into one pot of the city revenue. Okay, so trying to be compensated for your time won't necessarily allow you to hire more staff or anything like that. No. Maybe it would bolster your position though. All right, <laughs> that's it, thanks. Okay, 
So I'm uh, the reason I wanted to stop with cones is because I have another um, document that I'll, I'm going to come back to this fee schedule for COAs, but I have another, I put together some numbers today. Bridget, um, can we mark what I'm going to show as B3? I'll give you a title when you're ready. Okay. <clears throat> um, and we're going to call this uh, HPC fee averages. All right. So I pulled all of our applications from 2019, 2020, and 2021, because those are the three most recent years of complete data. Um, and I pull, and the reason I'm doing this now and not during COAs is because I think uh, the top table illustrates pretty well, if it wasn't already convincing, what the vast majority of fees are for HPC applications. Now, the average fee in this case, in this case is not particularly helpful. Um, I will just say for 2019, that average is much, much higher. You can see in the table below, our revenue that year was really high because we had one $25,000 application and two $12,000 applications. So that drove our average fee much higher. The numbers here that I really wanted to point out are the median and mode. Uh, going, what is this, sixth grade math, I think, or something like that. So these are the most common application fee, as well as the application fee that falls in the middle of the group, right? So that median one is the one, if you laid everything out on a line, that's the one that comes straight in the middle. And that's, like I said, that most common $20 exterior fee for a one unit building. That is the one that if you lay everything out, that's the absolute middle. Everything below that is going to be $20 still, and probably halfway up that chain is also still going to be $20. And for 2019 and 2020, the most common fee that we charged was $10 um, for interior. And 2021, the most common fee that we charged was $20 for, I, I in this particular case, I do not know if it's exterior work for one unit or interior work for two units. But still, the vast majority of applications that we have are in this $10 to $20 range. So while, yes, those cone fees are doubling, they are absolutely doubling. They're not, they're doubling, the vast majority of things that we see are on the smaller end of this. So that $10 becomes $20, that $20 becomes $40. Um, and frankly, those fees pale in comparison to the $100 that zoning charges for review, as well as the wide variety of fees that building charges for their permitting. They're, they're still on the lower end. We're not looking to, this is not a, ca <laughs> this is not a cash grab. Um, we're be, I'm being very blunt in saying that we need to make a significant more, amount more money. You can see in the table below the HPC revenue typically hovers right around right around $35,000. And we have three full-time staff people. Um, that 2019 year was a true anomaly. But <laughs> we just happened to have three really big applications that year. Um, so the, these fees really do need to increase. We're, it's not a cash grab. We're just looking to cover some more of our costs. Maggie, can I say that these fees still seem really cheap by comparison for what any project you want to do on your house costs tens and twenty a hundred thousand dollars and you're charging a forty dollar fee is yeah. is crazy it's like a giveaway I, um, I there I mean I, I definitely think if we could charge by the hour from staff time people would be genuinely shocked um, and probably would bring their projects into conformance a lot faster. But, well, I mean, you know, just take, for example, your demolition, um, you know, determination fee. You, you put a couple of hours into that. And obviously, someone who's looking to demolish the building is a developer and someone who's looking to cash in on this site. So why aren't we cashing in on them cashing in? You know, it's like, uh, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, but that's just me. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen and we'll go over the COA. Oh, I closed out of it. Hold on. Um, and then we have another section of just kind of some miscellaneous fees that we can discuss as well. And then we can go back to discussing this as a whole. Okay. So the COA fees, this is where we see, um, I mean, again, I know the cone fees are doubling, but this the COA fees are, is where we see like a truly substantial change. Um, and we also see a little bit of a revision into how we calculate the fees for COAs. So um, the first one is for new construction on vacant land. So something similar to 215 Warren tonight, right? That's considered new construction on vacant land. Previously, that fee was $500. Um, we are raising that fee to $1,000, which is consistent with a major site plan for planning board. Um, and that is that $1,000 is in addition to the residential and or non-residential fees, which we'll discuss in a second. So moving down a residential COA. So this is most of the COAs that we see, right? This is someone looking to put a rear yard addition on their house, someone looking to put a roof deck on their house, um, you know, things like that. Someone who wants to put in non-conforming windows. So our previous fee structure is below, right? So you had one to four dwelling units. That application was $100. So the vast majority of COA that have ever come to this board have been $100 flat, that's it. Um, and then five dwelling units are over, it was $20 per dwelling unit to a maximum of a thousand. Um, so with some very basic math here, it cost the same. So if someone owned a five unit building and they wanted to put in vinyl windows in the front of their property, it quite literally cost them the same amount of money to follow our guidelines and get a cone as it did for them to come to the board and try to get approval for vinyl windows. It was the exact same amount of money for them to try that. So that's honestly why we've had applications like that because people look at that fee and they go, oh, I'm just gonna take my chances at the board. And then if they deny it, then we'll come back and figure it out. And, I, and as staff, there's not really much I can do about that because it's their right. If they want to try, they can, but there was really no incentive for them not to try. So the way that we're proposing calculating residential fees from here on out is $100 per unit or a minimum of $500. So if someone, is, for example, if someone is purchasing a two unit uh, townhome and they want to put a rear yard addition on the back um, because their minimum per unit is less than $500, their application is automatically $500 because we're working off a minimum here. Um, and there is no maximum on this fee. This $100 per unit um, for new construction is also in addition to the $1,000 that they pay as a flat fee. So for example, I'm using 215 Warren because they were here tonight. That was new construction with three units. So that application fee when they came to the board was $500 tonight. But if this was adopted, their application fee would be $1,500 based on the new way that we'd be proposing to calculate this. For non-residential, um, we're actually staying with $100 per thousand square feet of GFA. Um, this actually, especially for larger projects, this is a pretty fair fee. Um, most of, I'm sorry, but that we are adding a minimum of $500. So for um, I'm trying to think of the last commercial application you guys saw that uh, the cannabis one on Bay Street um, there they had I think it was just over 3,000 square feet of space so because they're not meeting that minimum threshold their fee would be $500 but something um, like so the $25,000 application we had in 2019 was the entirety of 150 Bay when they retrofitted it to have dorms for Nyack College. That was the $25,000 application. Their fee would be staying the same because again, it's a pretty, we're not looking to impose a hardship on small businesses that come in and want to make some changes but require a COA. But that $100 fee does, it's still a pretty substantial fee on a larger commercial project. 
um, exterior sign applications are going from 100 to 200. Um, it, this is just more reflective of the amount of time that staff puts into these. Um, and then additional fees. So the outdoor cafe, like I said, is not changing. Um, if I get the opportunity in the future to revise the outdoor cafe ordinance to take out to, I'm sorry, to refer back to the HPC fee schedule instead of having $100 written in there, I will. Um, and then we can talk about revising this. <laughs> but right now it's staying the same. Um, extension of a COA approval is going from 200 to 250. That is um, in line with planning board and zoning board for their extensions. A demolition review is going from $100 to 250. Um, the thinking behind this is that demo reviews do take longer for staff time. It is a similar type of review, but demolition permits require us intaking all of those permitting forms, making sure they're accurate. Um, we do require additional items to review for demo reports. We have to sign all of that. We have to get it over to zoning. There's, there's more work for a demolition permit. Um, and then determinations of significance are going from 100 to 150. I'm going to skip over CO right now. Um, and then special meetings requested by the applicant. Right now, they're $700. We're revising that to be 1000 That is That fee revision is reflective of um, when we have a special meeting, we publish the uh, everything in the paper that needs to happen for it. We pay Bridget to be there. Um, and we also pay me, Sarah, Dan, any staff member to be there as well. So that fee needs to be adjusted to, calcul to uh, consider that. The last one is we are adding a fee for a certificate of occupancy review. Right now, every um, CO review that HPC staff does is free. <laughs> we don't have a fee structure for this. And we, we get a significant amount of CO applications, whether they're COs or CCOs or TCOs. Um, for every COA that comes in and requires HPC to go close it out, we are doing that on the city's dime. Um, and it is honestly kind of ridiculous that we didn't have a fee for this already, especially when it is something that we require that staff does within those COA approvals. Um, so that $100 fee is matching what zoning charges for a CO review as well. I'm trying to keep that at least consistent between the two divisions. Okay, do you guys have any questions about any of that? I know it's a lot of information to intake at once, um, but we're just trying to you know, be honest about where we are in terms with fees and that the, again, this is really not, a, this is not a money grab. We're just trying to at least compensate for some of the work that we do. Not to beat a dead horse, but that outdoor cafe charge the, the rest of the fees make a distinction between residential and non-residential use. And this is clearly a commercial use where we don't want to penalize small businesses, but if they're using it for a money-making venture, I would feel more comfortable charging more when the opportunity arises. Um, for the special meeting fee, was that also last updated at the, at the time that the rest of this was? So, my so my understanding is that there I, I can't give you specific dates as to when our fee ordinance was last updated. I did ask Dan. Dan could not recall the last time that cone or COA fees were updated. Brian, I, you might have more information on that than I do. The, the fees as they are now are the fees when I worked started working there ten yeah. years ago. Yeah, and so, I, I I do think it probably dates to two thousand one. So yeah. That's, that's fine. That's everyone in the office who I asked, that's everyone's understanding of it. Um, we did add in the determination of significance fee uh, back when that ordinance was adopted. And then um, in 2019, we changed the determination of significance fee and the demolition permit fee to go from 40 to 100. <laughs> so that's the last time I'm aware that our fees were updated, um, at least for those. And for what it's worth, um, that fee doubled, well, more than doubled. And I, we have not had a single bit of pushback on that at all. I recognize it's a slightly different clientele that's coming in for those types of applications, but um, I'd like to think that the fees, they're still reasonable while also giving us an increase in revenue. 
So generally, um, even with the increased fees, we're not looking to recoup the amount that the city expends on salaries and other costs. And I think that makes sense that we're not trying to break even. Um, one possible exception would be the court reporter's fees. Um, for regular meetings, it's impossible, I think, to pass those costs along the applicants because there may be multiple applications and things being heard on any given evening. But for special meetings, we typically only hear a single application. So would it be possible to uh, pass those costs on to the applicant so that they bear the expense? So um, the, Bridget, feel free to jump in whenever you want, but the way our court reporter fees are structured is that we are paying Bridget's appearance fee as well as her overtime and the pages fee for any city related um, application. So what we're discussing right now, we will be paying for, but when the applicants, um, when there's an application scheduled, um, Bridget and I reach out to the applicant and they send her a deposit and all of our, all of the applications that are heard are charged to the applicant. I will jump in, but it's hard. It's very common for application applicants when they have a um, special meeting request that they pay for the court reporter also. They pay the whole fee for that special meeting. Right. So our that $1,000 fee is intended to uh, cover the court reporter fee if they don't already. And it's 700 now? It's 700 now, yeah. I I think my only comment is that we should charge even more for a special meeting because I think we should really, I think we should discourage special meetings and this should be a real penalty. I mean, I think it should be $1,500 at a minimum. Um, most, of, most of the time it's people's own self-created problems, <laughs> not looking at a calendar and getting get it to us in the first place, so. Right. Uh, I, I think I think the fee should be enough that people should think twice about whether or not they actually want to pay for it. I think that's the only thing that the only comment I have on this is is that fee. That's a good point because although the commissioners aren't compensated, we do spend our time. Yeah, right. And we go out of our way often on very short notice and often for these for projects where people are often those those projects are often under deadlines and those are projects which we off, people often put certain pressures on us. I feel like that they, they even have a special meeting and there's a certain pressure to it because of various factors. So um, yeah, that, that's so, my only comment. So um, I just pulled up what planning and zoning board do for special meetings um, and their special meeting requests are $3,000. I think we should charge 2000. Yeah. Uh, forget forget 1500 should be it, it should be a real penalty i think yeah i do know that their their fee um includes their outside attorney fees so i think two thousand dollars taking off a thousand dollars to account for the fact that we do not have an outside attorney makes sense okay i'm all for it I also think as the residential cone, the exterior residential cone, mm -hmm. I, I, I think Paul mentioned this. I think it's still too low. Okay. Um, if you think of every building in their historic districts, they're all the minimum value of a building in the historic district is probably closing on a million now. And for $40 to be the fee to do work on the exterior of the building, that's, you know, I go into Manhattan, that's my parking for an hour and a half. I mean, it's, it's, you're having people look at an application, you're having, you know, um, your staff work on that application. Uh, it, I think it should be higher than $40 for exterior. Interior, you want to encourage them, you know, to come in and just, I think that's fine. I don't think you really do a lot of, spend a lot of time on it, you could confirm, but but for exterior, you could spend a lot of time on an application. Yeah, yeah. So, so I would say you're right. Like for interior, it's with the the thing that holds up a lot of interior applications is that the applicants might not submit all of the information that we need for that interior change. Um, 
like we'll we'll get a lot of just applications that's like I use this example a lot we get like the form that says replace hot water heater and they'll give us building permits but they don't give us a photo of the outside of the building which makes sense right it's interior work but it's a required part of the application that's generally when interior applications take a longer time because then we have to reach out to the applicant, give them an incomplete checklist, and then when they and then update the timing of the application because at that point then their 45 day clock stops and then they have to resubmit it to us. Sometimes they submit like Google Maps and we can't take that and then we have to go back to the applicant. So that's generally when interior ones hold us up. Um, you're you are right, Tony, that forty dollars is still on the low end. It is like. It is the fee that I think as staff, me, Sarah, Dan, and Tanya really struggled with because that, for, so just for some like context of kind of some of the things that we go through on a daily basis, we will have people submit full, complete, top to bottom renovations, right? Where someone is buying a brownstone that's in a bit of tough shape and it's currently four units but they're buying it so that their whole family can live there so they're going down to one unit completely redoing the facade proposing to add a full height addition on the back with a roof deck wants to put in crazy windows something like that we intake that we tell them it's going to be a cone a coa and they say i don't want to go to the board how do we get this down and then we spend a bunch of time going back and forth saying okay well these are the requirements for a staff approval in order to meet that you have to you have to abide by these requirements and then we work with them we work with their architect we spend probably 20 to 30 hours going back and forth with reviews getting the applicant what they want which is to be able to get this done at a staff level and in our current fee structure me or sarah has just spent 30 hours on an application and it's 20 dollars Right. But Crazy. you have to, con but right. But you have to contrast that with the people who need to just repoint their brick. And that's the only thing that they're doing. And that's also $20 people who are making minor exterior changes. That's $20 people who are moving and need to pull a UST. Like the, the, the scale of work that falls under that specific part of our fee ordinance is so wild that it's honestly really difficult to place. But at, at the end of the day, like you said, this isn't, there's no like direct relationship between the intake and the, and the cost. And as far as the cones go, I, I, I'm, I'm conscious that, you know, we, we want to encourage people to maintain their buildings and keep it in shape. And we don't want the, we don't want a $150 fee or, you know, we're, uh, uh, 40, 40 may be too low. I don't know, but we don't want that fee to be a, a deterrent for people to like not replace that window. Right. So. Uh -huh. I, yeah. I, and I think, I think it'd be very a deterrent. I mean, Maggie, how many applications do you get from a homeowner versus from a contractor? And I know it in New York a lot, we've found that there are some app, some contractors who will charge you know, certain fees just for getting LPC or equivalent permits, they might be charging a thousand dollars in their contract and the HPC permit is maybe only $150 or whatever it may be. That might even be just for interior. You know, we don't know what, what a contractor is charging. I mean, there might be a case where an uh, older um, homeowner who is, you know, uh, on a fixed income, we don't, I don't think we want to, um, a fee that's going to discourage them from anything. So I don't think we want to put it too high, but I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that I know, we, we, I know that contractors charge way more for get when they are the ones getting the permits than what, um, what we charge either at LPC, HPC, or probably anywhere. Mm -hmm. I'd say it's probably on the high end, two thirds contractors, one third homeowner. It's somewhere in between 50-50 and two-thirds, one-third. I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head. I only know the exact numbers for demolition permits, which is almost 100% contractors <laughs> or expediters. I'm, I'm lumping expediters and contractors into one. Yeah. And okay. even a $250 fee is not going to discourage anyone from demolishing a building. No. 
if that if that's what they want to do in redeveloping it so yeah so the the demolition fees in particular um we so we're <laughs> we're at the staff capacity right now where we get so many of them where we actually we have an outside consultant who does them now um we review it's hunter research they they do phenomenal work but and we of course review their recommendations they make recommendations to us for them and then we review them we go back and forth with them pretty frequently on stuff but those fees are being raised to accommodate that cost of sending them out so the, that fee there is really less of discouraging it and more just making sure that we're not losing money by sending them out which right now we are <laughs> Maggie, that example you gave of an applicant who tries very hard to avoid having to come before the commission and you end up charging them that lesser fee, I, I can see how that could be frustrating. At the same time, we, we would want to incentivize them to work with staff to accomplish that because if they do end up having to come before the commission, I assume in the long run, it's going to ultimately end up being more work. Um, you're still going to have to resolve it and then you're going to have to get all of us involved and in, in right. do it during the meeting. And just on a general note, you know, I'm thinking of the countervailing interests here. I think just generally one of the most uh, common criticisms of historic preservation generally is that it, it causes hyper gentrification. And so um, we don't want to make going through our processes and, and complying to be completely unaffordable and unattainable for the average homeowner. Um, I can understand. Um, taking a stronger tack with, uh, with developers um, and uh, those who are pursuing commercial interests. But it's, it's, I guess it's hard to get that granular in our fee structure. Um, you were saying that the range of situations that are covered by some of these fees ranges from the minimal to the quite extravagant. So uh, have you seen any examples of a city that's been successful in trying to parse out uh, a fee structure that takes those different situations into account and charges accordingly. So I, ha I admittedly, I have not done enough research to be able to answer that. Um, I took the examples from the nearest cities to us also because they happen to be, to my knowledge at least, from the information I've received when requested, some of the only places in New Jersey that require historic preservation fees. Um, when I reached out to Trenton, they don't charge. Patterson does not charge. Plainfield does not charge. So the pool that we're going off of, at least in New Jersey, of places that even charge at all for this review is very small. Mm. So I have not admittedly explored outside of this immediate realm. Uh, but within New Jersey, no. No one really parses them out like that. I wonder what they're doing over in Europe. No, that's for the that's for the next fee hike. <laughs> but there's got to be a better way to do it, right? Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, just I didn't. I meant to cover them in the earlier part, but um, just so it's on the record, um, we do not charge HPC fees for not profit, not for profit, or government buildings. We really can't. Um, and just also part of the, one of the reasons that we're also looking at raising the fees is as of late city staff <laughs> has been doing a lot more um, HPC consultation without a fee structure in place um, that really has no plans to have a fee structure in place. So we're specifically thinking of, um, you know, some of the, so let's, an example that's currently actively on our table agenda, 591 Montgomery. That is a, they came for a special meeting. They're going to come back relatively soon. They are not a designated landmark, but they are a local landmark, but they are on the state and national register. We are making a recommendation to uh, the planning board. We're not collecting a fee for that. It's not locally listed. That is just, we are doing that because the planning board asked us to. So we don't get a fee from that. Same thing with um, the lows. We don't see a fee from that. So in order to be able to accommodate those types of reviews, we also need to look at other places where, again, not we're not looking to make up money. We're just looking to kind of cover some of those costs. And again, I know that's out of context. I just should have said it earlier and I wanted to make sure it was on the record. But going back to those that exterior fee. So if you just 
spitballing here. If we think that $40 is too low, what is something that when you look at that, it, like would going up to $60 or is that just something that we think might be better to leave at 40? Maggie, is it possible to do like under 25,000 this fee and over 25,000, you know, another fee? Is you know, it like possible? Or, or a number, just a, a flat number. I mean, I think New York City does that, right? Uh, probably Brian knows. Okay. Say that again, what was the question? Um, is it possible to do a fee somewhat based on value of the project? I mean, the, most people are gonna know what their, what their value is. If they're pointing the building, they already got a price on it, you know? New York only. If, if they're putting only windows in. Oh, one speaker. <clears throat> New York only actually chart New York LPC doesn't actually collect any of the perm uh, the uh, fees themselves. It's all collected when you go to DOB. They collect the LPC fee for us, and I actually have no idea what LPC's fees are. To be honest with you, only that something like just repointing a building, which is something that doesn't require a DOB permit, which is like repointing a building, replacing windows, which would be considered a permit for minor work, does not even get a fee collected because they don't go to DOB. So and that's why we didn't look at New York City to base yeah. off of. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So they did collect um, like six and a half million dollars in fees last year, I think. So, um, but I do believe it is based on some percentage of the project, but Kelly actually might, might know more than me. I just, I, I looked it up online and it, it came up that up to 25,000, it was $95 for a flat, the, the sort of a flat fee, I'm sorry. But I, I'm not, I don't want that on the record as being true. I don't know. I don't know, that's what I- So Tony, to answer, your, to answer your question of if it's possible to do that, yes, it's possible. Um, based on, however, I will tell you that I, that is something that I don't think is feasible for us. Um, we currently collect commercial, those non-residential fees based on square footage and getting that information out of applicants, you would think I was doing an extraction with no Novocaine. It is physically painful. The amount of people who have no clue what their square footage is, is honestly mind boggling. The, I spend a lot of time on Google maps measuring things trying to get a baseline square footage of their roof that we can then apply, multiply by however many floors they have and then add 500 and call it a day. It's like, that's truly, that's how, like the amount of people who are like, can you just figure it out for me? I'll pay whatever. It, it's astounding. So Maggie, oh. um, are we thinking that we're going to get on to uh, some sort of a schedule where these fees are going to be revisited moving forward at regular intervals rather than sort of whenever somebody remembers, hey, wait, our fees are way too low. Um, that way, you know, if we're committing to a fee structure now, we don't necessarily feel like we're, we're tying our hands for the next 20 years. We can revisit in a year or two. Yeah. So I mean, the ability to read, there's no schedule in place to answer your question. There is no necessary plan to say, let's look at these every two years. Um, the ability to change our fee schedule is entirely at the whim of the administration and the city council, because this is an ordinance amendment. So we need to make a recommendation to the planning board who will then make a recommendation to city council where there will be two first reading and a second reading before, and then 21, I think days before it goes into effect. Um, right now there is an appetite to change our fees. And as long as there continues to be an appetite, I'm very open to revisiting it at a regular interval, but it's not, I mean, we could always propose it and get it shot down. No one likes to do that, <laughs> but um, as long as there's an appetite to it, I'm more than willing to revisit it. So uh, un under the structure that we're proposing, not tied to construction costs or square footage or anything like that, but simply uh, to number of units. Uh, from my point of view, it seems somewhere in the vicinity of 80 to 100 seems like a low enough threshold that it's not going to deter 
anyone from from fixing their the front of their house, I I, I would suggest not to go above that um, level personally. So I think a hundred dollars is a good number. So a hundred dollars though is the same amount as a cone as a COA per unit residential. I think it should be like fifty. I mean, I think. I think for a, for a certificate of no effect, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say if you guys okay. were interested. We taking, sorry. I was going to say if you guys were interested in bumping that up, I was going to suggest 50 or 60. Are we planning on taking action tonight on this tonight, or are you going to like take this back and then come back maybe at the next meeting? So, I mean, to be completely honest, there are two changes you guys are recommending. I think if you would like to take action on this, which um, I'll be honest is kind of what I was hoping would happen. But if you guys want to wait on it, we can. But right now there's really only two changes. And I think that, that there are things that we could pretty easily accommodate. If you'd like to sit on it, that's okay. But um, I know that we, similarly to how these are all changes that are proposed at the will of the administration, there is an appetite for this right now. And I don't, really want to lose that headwind. I'm happy to put it past this tonight. Same. I'll just say that I'm I'm more in uh, Brian's camp and would support the $50. Anyone want 60 or are we good with 50? 50 it is. Okay. So just to clarify those two changes that you guys are recommending to the proposed fee schedule is an increase in exterior fees or is an increase in a cone fee for exterior work or exterior and interior work filed concurrently from its current rate of $20 per unit to $50 per unit. And then you guys are also proposing a change uh, for the special meeting fee of once the current fee is $700 per special meeting and the proposed fee for this would be $2,000 per special meeting. Good. Yeah. Okay, so the recommendation from staff is to make a motion to approve the changes to the fee schedule and make a recommendation for adoption to the planning board. Um, staff notes that because this is just a motion for a recommendation and a motion for approval that only a simple majority is needed. I will make said motion. Who had the set? Kelly, got it. Okay. All right. I'll do a roll call. Commissioner Gucciardo is absent. Commissioner Stango is absent. Commissioner Gunther. Aye. Commissioner Gordon. Aye. Commissioner Amatuza. Aye. Commissioner Sakan. Aye. Commissioner Lewis. Aye. Vice Chair Sankamp. Aye. And Chairman Blazak. Aye. All right. The recommendation for planning board and approval of the fee changes is approved. Seven yeas, zero nays, zero abstentions. Uh, so it's approved. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank All you. All right. Let's finish out this agenda. So let me open it up. It would be great if my computer would listen to me. Any okay. updates on the table? Do you all, I have it up. Do you want me to read it? No, I just got it up. Um, Gary Siegel is getting another email for me. If he doesn't respond in 30 days, I'm taking this off. Um, 591 Montgomery, we are, they submitted plans, uh, revised plans. I know Dan and Sarah have been working on that. I don't know if it's better or worse. Um, but they are actively looking to get scheduled once they are complete at planning board with those changes. Um, so I would anticipate seeing them before the end of the year. Uh, I have no update on French American Academy. I have no update on Sugartown. And so 11 Erie Street was the one that was on our agenda that I had to cancel. Uh, you will find out, I, I will leave you all in suspense and you will find out why at the next meeting. Um, but they are, they were carried from Octo August 15th um, and they are currently yeah. scheduled for the October 3rd meeting. 
Um, so at that October 3rd meeting, we'll have the blocks two through eight of the embankment, 11 Erie, and probably two other things. Okay, um, we have no resolutions to introduce, discuss, or memorialize. We do not need an executive session unless there is something you all know that I do not, which leaves us just for adjournments. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 928.